Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Gorodnik. Um, I have the privilege of chairing the City Planning Commission. Uh, the time is 10 o'clock. Welcome to today's public meeting, August 10th, 2022. Uh, we have two uh, important projects on the agenda today for hearings, uh, one for East New York, Brooklyn, the other in Astoria, Queens. And we also have a couple of historic districts uh, also in Queens. In East New York, uh, we are going to hear an HPD proposal that would bring about 700 new and 100% affordable homes to the neighborhood in amendment an amendment to an existing urban renewal plan called Gateway Site 26A and Phase 5. Um, uh, this plan, which uh, may be due for a new name, uh, includes homes for seniors and affordable housing for families. Uh, and in Astoria, uh, we will discuss a proposed mixed-use project that is known as Innovation Queens. Here, the project team is looking to make a big investment in the area, and they are seeking permission to build more than 2,800 new homes, 711 of them affordable in an underutilized area, including commercial space, community facility use, and 2.17 acres of open space along Northern Boulevard and Steinway Street. I will note, uh, as it relates to uh, today's hearing, if anyone is in need of translation services, we will have translators available to help you in uh, Spanish, Bengali, Mandarin, and Greek. Uh, so when you sign up to testify, there's going to be an option to choose a preferred language, and each translator will take an opportunity to introduce themselves before the hearing uh, and give instructions before testifying in their respective languages. So you can sign up to testify at nyc.gov forward slash engage. We will also have a public hearing on the two proposed historic districts that I noted uh, at the beginning. Uh, they are both in Cambria Heights, Queens. Um, so we're looking forward to those public hearings. And before all that, we're gonna approve our minutes, schedule some projects for future hearings, and have two votes. The two votes will be on 2017 Grand Concourse, which will bring more than 30 new 100% affordable homes from HPD to Mount Hope in the Bronx. And the second at 2080 McDonald Avenue uh, would bring over 60 homes to Graves and Brooklyn, a quarter of them affordable. So that is where we're headed today. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I am going to, um, uh, turn to Ryan uh, to uh, take us through the precise mechanics of how one might testify today, recognizing the instructions are long and perhaps even a little longer today. But Ryan, floor C is yours. Certainly. So, so verbal testimony may be provided online or by calling in on your telephone. Uh, if you wish to speak, you must register through the NYC Engage portal, uh, which is uh, cited here on the screen. Uh, if you wish to access the hearing, please register through the upcoming meetings page of the portal. A link to join the hearing is on the landing page after you register, uh, so don't close that landing page without first clicking on the link. If you are accessing the hearing via phone and wish to speak, you must register with the dial-in participant hotline at the numbers listed on the screen. If one of the numbers is busy, please try another. The meeting ID uh, is 618 Two three seven seven three nine six. Press pound to skip the participation ID, and the password is the numeral one. The phone number is also posted on the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. Note that no matter how you how you are accessing the meeting, you must register if you want to speak. Those accessing the meeting online will have the option to turn on their camera while giving testimony. When it's your turn to speak, you'll be notified and promoted to a panelist. This will allow you to unmute your microphone and give you the ability to turn on your camera. Listen closely for your name to be called. There will be a short period where it will appear that you're no longer in the meeting. Don't be alarmed. You should rejoin, re rejoin the meeting as a panelist. If you're accessing the hearing via phone, 
your name will be called from the list of registered speakers. Once your name has been called, you'll be given the ability to unmute yourself. You do this by pressing star six to unmute your phone. For those listening to the hearing through the online live stream who have not yet registered to speak but decide they wish to do so during the hearing, you must first register uh, to speak through the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. For those accessing the hearing via phone who have not yet registered to speak but wish to do so, you must also register through the dial-in participant hotline that I described a moment ago. Speakers are limited to three minutes of testimony with a few exceptions. Elected officials are accorded the courtesy of jumping to the front of the queue and are not limited to three minutes. Uh, if the consecutive translation services are being used, uh, which are being offered uh, for the Innovation Queens hearing later today, the time will be extended to five minutes. And if an applicant team with three or more speakers wishes to make a team presentation, the team will be generally allowed a total of 10 minutes. Uh, the chair will announce when the time limit is reached. Uh, be mindful of potential background noise during the testimony. Make sure that if you are watching the proceedings via live stream, then the live stream, if the live stream is muted when you begin your testimony, otherwise you'll hear an echo. And if you wish to submit the testimony uh, in writing, uh, that should be submitted to the Department of City Planning. The mailing and email addresses can be found at our website, planning.nyc.gov. Uh, lastly, note that this remote public hearing is being recorded. Um, as noted before, there are translators available in Mandarin, Bengali, Greek, and Spanish for the Innovation Queens hearing. So people testifying in those languages on Innovation Queens uh, can announce their presence uh, and availability uh, in the language noted above. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, and again, welcome to everyone uh, to our remote public hearing. I'm going to turn to the secretary uh, and ask her to go ahead and begin the meeting officially. Good morning. This is the City Planning Commission public meeting held remotely through the NYC Engage portal. Today is Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. I will now call the roll. Chair Garotnik. Here. Vice Chair Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Bozar. Here. Commissioner Bernie. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. Commissioner Duick. Here. Commissioner Eady. Here. Commissioner Gold. Here. Commissioner Goodridge. Here. Commissioner Marin. Here. Commissioner Osorio. Here. Commissioner Rampershad. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the public meeting of Wednesday, July 27, 2022. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the minutes, I make a motion to approve the minutes of the public meeting of uh, Wednesday, July 27th. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are approved. Scheduling, calendar numbers one through 14. We have resolutions for adoption scheduling oh. Wednesday, August 24th, 2022 for a remote public hearing to be held through the NYC Engage portal. Thank you. On the resolutions, I make a motion to approve. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. The ayes have it. Resolutions are approved. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page eight. Reports. Borough of the Bronx, calendar numbers 15 and 16, 2017 Grand Concourse, CD5, calendar number 15, C220356, HAX, Calendar number 16, C220357, PQX, in the matter of an application for UDAP designation, project approval, disposition of city owned property, and acquisition concerning 2017 Grand Concourse. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 15 and 16, Chair Garotnik. I vote aye. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bozark. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Duick. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Commissioner Eady. Yes. yes, thank you. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Commissioner Goodrich. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Osorio. Yes. Commissioner Rompershad. Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 15 and 16. Borough Brooklyn, calendar numbers 17 and 18, 2080 McDonald Avenue, CD 11, calendar number 17, C210174 ZMK, calendar number 18, and 210175ZRMK. 
In the matter of an application for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 2080 McDonald Avenue. For favorable reports on calendar numbers 17 and 18, Chair Garodnik. Aye. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bozad. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Dewick. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Commissioner Goodridge. Yes. Commissioner Marin. Yes. Commissioner Osorio. Yes. Commissioner Ramprashad. Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers 17 and 18. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page 10. Excellent. Just a reminder, uh, we're going to ask those who are testifying today to limit the remarks to three minutes, uh, after uh, which time uh, the uh, the team here will uh We'll mute you, so please don't think us rude. We just want to keep it uh, <clears throat> consistent across all uh, people testifying. Uh, so I am going to ask you, um, Madam Secretary, to call the first item. Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers 19 and 20, gateway site 26A in phase five, CD5, calendar number 19, C220405HAMK, calendar number 20, C220406HUK, public hearing in the matter of an application for UDAP designation, project approval, disposition of city-owned property, and an amendment to an urban renewal plan concerning gateway site 26A in phase five. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to... Uh... Uh, welcome to the panel here, the applicant team, which includes uh, the following. Um, starts with Andrew Bernheimer, Arshad Bacchus, Kirk Goodrich, Eunice Sue, Michael Gelfand, Sushma Pramod, and Dean Oliver. Welcome to all of you, and whenever you are settled in and ready, you can go ahead and proceed. You have 10 minutes. Hey, uh, thank you so much, Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. My name is Sushma Pramod, and I represent the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. And we're here to present the Gateway Site 26A and Phase 5 Development Projects, which I agree does need a new name. Uh, I am joined today by Alina Firishta, Director of Brooklyn Planning at HPD, and by members of the development team. Uh, Asha Bakus from Nehemiah and Andy Bernheimer from Bernheimer Architects will also speak today. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, I'll begin by introducing the land use actions and describe the background of the area, after which the sponsor team will delve deeper into the proposal uh, and we'll end by answering any questions you might have. Next, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, the Gateway Site 26A uh, and Phase 5 project was certified on April 25th, received approval from the Borough President on August 4th and Community Board on August 8th. Uh, approval will facilitate the development of one eight-story new construction building on Site 26A of the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Area with approximately 188 units of affordable rental homes for seniors, one additional supers unit, and approximately 3,000 square, uh, 3, square feet of community facility space on the ground floor. Approval will also facilitate a building typology change in the phase five area of the Spring Creek development to nine four-story buildings with approximately 560 affordable rental units. The project is being developed as a joint venture uh, between Nehemiah HDFC, which is the development arm of the East Brooklyn Congregations, or EBC, and Monarch Development. Uh, for Site 26A, we are seeking approvals for urban development action area designation and project approval for the disposition of city on land and for an amendment to the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Plan. The proposed amendment would allow change of designated use of Site 26A from public and semi-public uses to residential use. It will allow the increase in the allowable dwelling units in the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Area to account for the units proposed at Site 26A and it would allow the proposed building at Site 26A to be developed up to eight stories. For phase five, we are only seeking an amendment to the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Plan since approvals for disposition and UDAP designation have already been granted. The proposed amendment will allow for the merging of certain urban renewal sites and to assign maximum permissible units on these sites to facilitate a building typology change from a number of eight unit buildings that were previously envisioned to nine four story apartment style buildings. There is no change to total unit count nor height in phase five from when it was previously approved. Next slide, please. 
Um, for just a little bit of background, the Amaya Spring Creek area was previously used as a landfill until the 1950s and was re envisioned through the Gateway Estates and Gateway Estates 2 plans to create affordable home ownership and rental opportunities, as well as regional and local retail. Um, this has been a multi phase effort, which has resulted in over 1,600 units of affordable housing, along with the Gateway Shopping Center and other local retail. The development sites are currently vacant land and have always been vacant. Next slide, please. Um, I'll hand this over to Ashad. Uh, thank you so much, Shishma, and good morning, Chair Garodnik, Vice Chair Knuckles, Commissioners. Thank you all for the opportunity to present. I'm Arshad Bakis and I serve as the director of Nehemiah HDFC. Um, as Shishman mentioned, Nehemiah is a development arm of the East Brooklyn Congregation or EBC. We're pleased to partner with Monadnock Development to develop site 26A and phase five. The development team further consists of Bernheimer Architect for site 26A and MHG for phase five. We also have several other consultants that are part of the development team shown here. Next slide, please. Uh, East Brooklyn Congregation, Nehemiah HDFC and Monadnock Development are seeking financing for and this ULRP action to develop 189 units of senior housing, inclusive of one super unit. The project will be financed through the HPD SARA program. This rendering shows a frontal facade of the proposed building. The building will face east and front Erskine Street. Next slide, please. Uh, site 26A is identified on this map by the broken yellow lines just right of the center. It is located on, on Erskine Street between Vandalia Avenue and Schroeder's Avenue. Bordering the west end of the site is the Berryman Playground, which is owned and operated by the city's park department. This park includes a paved walkway, green space, active play equipment for young children, and a comfort, comfort station. The green shaded area at the back um, are previous home ownership phases of the Nehemiah Spring Creek development. Um, we'll explore this map clockwise. So moving to the north of the development is, a Jer is the Jefferson Field, which has several fields, including a baseball field. Moving east across the street from the development site, shaded in orange, is the high density Empire State Development site developed by the Arkers. This project is currently being leased up. South, southeast of the site is the Brooklyn Development Center. Site 26A and the overall Nehemiah Spring Creek development is served by, among other bus lines, the B13, B94, and Q8. These bus lines terminate at the Gateway Shopping Center. They can be used to commute into Queens or Brooklyn. Just a block south of the site is the Gateway Shopping Center. The center boasts several large box stores such as Home Depot, Target, Best Buy, and Burlington. It also offers a large ShopRite supermarket and several eateries, both small and large. Next slide, please. The proposed development will be eight stories at its tallest point with several step downs along Schroeder's and Vandalia Avenue. All units will benefit from project-based Section 8 vouchers, which means no tenant will pay more than 30% of their income towards rent. Amenity spaces for residents include a community room, a fitness room, case management, and counseling offices. The counseling offices will be occupied by Breaking Ground as a social service provider. The project will also provide 10 rare yard ad grade parking spaces for residents at no cost. The site is expected to have on-site security and 24-7 security cameras that are monitored by a third-party security company. I'd now like to call in our project's architect, Bernheimer, to continue presentation of this slide and a few others. Thank you. Thanks, Arshad. So good morning and thank you to CPC for this opportunity to present the design for 26A. I'm Andy Bernheimer of Bernheimer Architecture. A little bit about that architecture. The building is masked in response to the local context that Arsha just described. Tallest on the east, which is the left side of the surrendering, facing existing buildings across Erskine Street, where there are new nine-story buildings. The north and south bars, and you'll see a plan in a second, extend towards the west and are shorter. These face Vandalia Avenue and Schroeder's Avenue, respectively. In this image, you are looking at our north elevation along Vandalia. These extensions step down to the west towards Berriman Playground, where the building is 
four stories in height. This stepping down provides relief in the massing from its copious sunlight into the public park while facing that playground with a shorter, smaller scale volume. PV arrays at the highest roof level and green roofs on the stepping masses provide energy, water management, and reduce the heat island effect of the architecture. The primary building material is brick with two tones of masonry manipulated texturally. Bricks pulled in and out create shadow and relief. These impart tonal changes depending on the raking sunlight and quality of daylight and will further break down the mass in the building into smaller discrete pieces. Next slide, please. Our main entry is at the southeast corner of the site, the bottom left of this slide, at the intersection of Erskine and Schroeder's, and is generously landscaped with planting and open space at the entry. Due to the site planning, we have extra sidewalk width, and we have taken advantage of this to provide supplemental seating, planting, and a more welcoming first encounter with the building. On the ground floor at grade level, there is a significant area dedicated to social services for the residents and communal amenities all connected to a generous residential lobby that permits residents to move directly from the street to a nearly 4,500 square foot rear garden. On the ground floor facing north along Vandalia, there's a standalone 3,000 square foot space for community facility use. This rear garden will catalyze activities. We will provide walking paths, planter beds, passive areas for us, tables for activities, spaces for exercise and social services programs. To note, the development sites are not included in the preliminary flood insurance grade map. They are located in the 500 year flood zone and there are residential units on the ground floor toned here in yellow. Those are raised two feet above ground level and address this low risk. Another note, the development team has held several meetings with CB5 and among their top concerns is the lack of available street parking in the gateway area and the potential demand for parking in this growing community. Based on the team's experience with other senior projects in New York, and while this site is not in a transit zone, our design was modified to include 10 parking spaces. They are located towards the rear of the building and can be accessed through a curb cut on Schroeder's. The addition of parking reduced the total number of dwelling units from 191 to 189. Those were, units were located on the ground floor and were eliminated to accommodate the driveway. Next slide. The development site is located in proximity to several parks and playgrounds, including the Barrowman Playground, that's directly adjacent, um, as well as the Spring Creek Park and Shirley Chisholm State Park, which are within a half mile of the proposed building. With that, I'm gonna hand it back to Arsha. Thank you, next slide, please. Uh, we'd now like to briefly discuss phase five. Phase five spans several blocks and is located to the western end of the Nehemiah Spring Creek development and the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Area. Ma major boundaries include Flatlands Avenue to the north, Gateway Drive to the west, Vandalia to the south, and Elton to the east. This, develop this end of the development is primarily Hi. served by B84, B BM5, and the B6 bus lines. Next slide, please. Uh, I believe that is, is time, correct, Sarah? Did I hear that? Correct. Okay, um, well, thank you uh, for the, the presentation. I, uh, it seems like you were perhaps not, not quite finished, but we'll see if we can <clears throat> elicit a couple of uh, the final points here. Um, uh, with a with a question or two, let me let me just ask. The first question is, what, what were the what were the big picture uh, items that you did not get a chance to share with us, just so that we can uh, uh, decide whether or not to uh, uh, to probe further here? Uh, the next few slides were regarding phase five, uh, which is basically explaining the the ch proposed changes. Okay, I guess I would ask you to just very quickly do that because I think that's important for us to uh, uh, to hear today, although um, please do it quickly. Uh, do you want us to share the slides again? Um, go ahead, share the slides and then we'll, let's just do it. Uh, um, okay, let's, we can pick up from slide 13 and I think that's the only slide we need to present. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, the proposed amendments for phase five include the merging of two blocks, um, which will enable us to uh, develop, a, it, sorry, the merging of two blocks to enable the development of a different typography of buildings. Um, we're moving from 70 octet buildings 
Um, so 78 unit buildings to nine larger buildings. Those larger buildings will have approximately 40 units or 80 units. Um, there's also min minimal changes to the acreage of a couple of sites. Um, and that's all described here on this slide. Um, and then the following slide will show those buildings that I previously described that are going from eight unit octet buildings um, to larger buildings, 40 units and 80 units. Uh, okay. Total unit count for phase five is 560 units and nothing else is really changing. The height remains the same, number of units remains the same. Thank you. Okay, great. Let me just start off with a quick question about a phase five and the actions needed here. Um, I, uh, I don't believe that there's a use change needed for site five, uh, for phase, for site two, phase five, but there is for 26A, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. What is the, can you just share with us the history of that as to why that's included in one and not the other? Um, sure. Uh, phase five and all of the sites in phase five were always designated for residential use in the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Plan. Um, site 26A, however, was previously envisioned as a public and uh, semi-public use, probably uh, thinking of a daycare facility or a childcare facility. Uh, but given the need for senior housing, I think it was re-envisioned to have the senior housing building with a community facility space on the ground floor. I see. And that's also the, the reason why that site uh, requires uh, an amendment for the additional dwelling units, the increase in height, et cetera. Is that right? Correct. That's right. Okay. Got it. <clears throat> uh, and on the parking, um, so it sounds like... Uh, you, you are making efforts to try to be responsive to uh, comments that were heard at the community level. Um, and I recognize that the, the borough president has asked to go back to the, the original uh, framework. Um, just tell us, say a little bit more about what the impact, you know, you're gonna lose two units of housing uh, on 26A by, by adding in those 10 parking spaces. Can you say a little bit more about what happens to that uh, that space, the uh, 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 the courtyard space in 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 that uh, in that development with these with these additional parking uh, parking spaces? Sure. Actually, Andrew, would you like to take that? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, the the previous um, garden space just encompassed the entirety of the interior courtyard of the building. So, in order to cut the drive lane in and then get the parking spaces with a two way drive lane we had to remove about 5,000 square feet of green space on the interior. So we still have a um, reasonably significant amount, 4,500 square feet about. Um, it doesn't, it won't appreciably change the functionality of the green space. We'll still provide the same things we were planning on providing for, which was planter beds, walking paths, spaces for recreation, but it will just make it smaller. Uh, it won't change the programming of it. And just to, to balance um, the, you know, the, the, the desire to have some amount of parking here as expressed by the, the community with what actually is being proposed, then the number of units in that building is uh, what it's a, it's 130, 140 units. I'm sorry. What was the, what was the 189, 189, 189, right. 189 units and 10 and 10 parking spaces. What's the, like, what then would be the vision for those parking spaces? Would it be a lottery? Would it be for, um, people who work in the building, what 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 would be the the vision if we if if uh, if you all have gotten to that point yet? So uh, uh, we, I, I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Kurt. So so uh, good morning, uh, Chair Garadnik and and everyone on the commission. So it's Kirk Goodrich from Not Knock. Um, I wanted to in, uh, interject only because this has been like a a major point of contention about parking and inclusion of parking. Um, and so the conversation about having 10 parking spaces in a building that's 189 units, um, our commitment as a priority to the community uh, board and um, the council member was to make uh, a priority to have these spaces um, for tenants first um, at no charge. Um, and um, the idea is not to dedicate it to staff um, at the moment, unless there's a situation where no, no uh, parking is, uh, there, there are spaces that aren't used by tenants, maybe we could do that. But 
fundamentally it's going to be for tenants probably have to be allocated through some sort of lottery. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Um, let me go to uh, commission members, uh, commissioner Bernie, we're going to start with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I may have said this before, but I did just want to compliment the design team on, on the quality of the design, which I think is a, a step up from some work that we've seen from Niemeyer in the past. And, um, you know, my, my instinct is to give credit to the architects, but I realize that these are team, this is a team project and HPD and Niemeyer and Adnock and company all deserve credit for what I think is a, is a, a really uh, a good design. Um, I do have one sort of lingering concern about these projects and, and I'm sorry if I sound a bit like a broken record on this, but I feel that we're always responding to issues of uh, flood um, danger, you know, by wet proofing basements, dry proofing basements, raising things and so on. And that's all very well for flood. But when we look at long-term sea level rise, when streets will become permanently inundated, um, I do have a concern and I realize, you know, people say, well, you know, it's a mortgage cycle away or it's two mortgage cycles away, but that's all very well. But if we don't start planning for these eventualities now, uh, we're going to be in trouble before we know it. And, and this is a, a comment directed more to city planning than it is to the development team. But I do think that this is a persistent concern with these particular developments. That was it. It wasn't really a question. Okay, we got it. Thank, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, okay, let's see if there are other questions. Commissioner Osorio. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to build on the two previous points. First, ask a series of questions associated with uh, Chairs Garotnik's uh, questions to the team. Um, given that there's been so much um, a concern regarding the removal of the proposed units uh, and the construction of the parking facility. I, I just wanted to understand what's really the, the impetus for creating this. Uh, you've heard a specific recommendations coming from the borough, the Brooklyn Borough President's Office a, regarding uh, the need to reinstore the open space or the, to restore the open space to the 9,000 uh, plus square feet. And, and I just wanted to understand you know, what's driving really the need for, for these uh, spaces? I think you, you already mentioned sort of like uh, uh, conversations with uh, elected officials about this, but I wanted to understand from a programmatic point of view, why are these really required? So um, good morning, Commissioner Sario, Kirk Goodrich. Um, so um, we, we did seven or so meetings with the community board. In addition to that, um, Consistently, I mean, Monadnock and uh, and East Brooklyn congregations have been working together more than 25 years. Most of that time uh, in this subdivision, which is principally homeowners, and so we don't only rely on what we hear from community board. We rely on what we hear from our homeowners association and constituents um, through East Brooklyn congregations um, and. This is the two fair zone. And what we've consistently heard from everyone is a chorus um, of folks who really feel like parking is a premium here. Uh, and um, at the same time, with respect to this specific building, our experience is that seniors generally don't need um, nearly the amount of parking that families need. Um, and, and, um, and then typically low income populations are less likely to have, um, to, to have the same parking need as everyone else. So we understand the demographics, but also, um, given our history in the neighborhood and, 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 and in this subdivision specifically, and the consistency we heard, uh, um, the same message on the parking, we really felt the need to be responsive to it. Um, the second thing is we happen to be in a location where, in this particular site, where there's literally a park outside the back of the property that abuts the property. Um, in addition, there's Spring Creek Park and Shirley Chisholm Park. And so it's the Spring Creek subdivision actually has um, a, you know, a significant amount of green area already. And so from our perspective, weighing the need to really be responsive and listen to the people who live here um, 
and um, and weighing that against the loss of some um, of the courtyard, given the abundance, what we feel is an abundance of green space in the area, we felt that this change was warranted. Um, and um, and listen, this is a this is a community board and a and a, and a, a community that we've had we've been working in for. 25 years EBC for 40 plus years and that we have another thousand units of business plus another rezoning. And so just pragmatically, I, I, so one, I think they're right. And two, pragmatically not being responsive um, given our the length of our relationship in the past and the future uh, was on what would, would have been unwise for us. Thank you. I, I appreciate the the thoughtfulness of your response and and certainly the the trajectory of, of your organization and in and the commitment to the community. I guess what I would love to encourage you is to think about whether there are ways of balancing both the need for the parking space is one, but also the design aspects um, and construction materials that may be an opportunity to uh, maintain, for example. In addition to the needs of uh, children, which again, you know, I think we should should be equally balanced at a neighborhood level here, given the fact that we're talking about a playground and the conditions, the living conditions that are going to be adjacent to this space um, as another priority. And then maybe like uh, connecting to my second question, uh, building on on Commissioner um, uh, Bernie's question. I was wondering if you can expand a little bit on your analysis on the vulnerability of the site to coastal flooding uh, and, and whether or not the design of the parking space uh, as proposed reflects the need for permeability in a site that may be adjacent to another large open space, but given its proximity to the coastal zone is vulnerable to future flooding, sea level rise, et cetera. So I can speak to that very briefly. Um, it's in a, a moderate flood zone. It's in the 500 year flood zone. So it's not in a high risk flood area. Um, we can certainly um, look at the materials of the paving and discuss with the development team, um, the proper installation, porous paving or otherwise that will help deal with, with water management in the event, the inevitable event of future, future water, um, however many years down the road. So I think we can, we can speak to the development and the construction team about that. Um, but it is in, an, in, an, in a moderate risk 500 year flood zone and not in um, the higher risk flood zones. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know that this is outside of the 100, 100 year flood plain yet. I think that this is an opportunity to perhaps balance sort of what you're hearing from the community yeah. in terms of the concerns associated with impermeable parking surface versus a improved living conditions, uh, resilience, sustainability, et cetera. Thank yes, you. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bozarg. Hey, um, great to see the project teams and see this project um, move forward and, and excited about the future phases as well. Um, I just wanted to lend my voice. I know Kirk, you mentioned there's a chorus of voices about the parking. I wanted to also lend my voice to the other side of that chorus about um, just this issue. I know you're hearing a lot about it, but um, needing to balance these different demands around community concerns around parking, broader citywide concerns about loss of units. I know for this project, it's, it sounds like just two units. Hopefully you can make up those units in future phases. Um, that's, a, a, to me, it may be two units here, but the commission's also seeing other projects that come back after for modifications that reduce unit sizes, reduce total unit counts. And then this all adds up um, and contributes to our housing crisis, as you know. So um, hoping that you all can find a a place for these two units in future phases if, if this is where the project lands, but also wanted to add my voice to um, the chorus of, of uh, hoping the priorities switch back the other way. Um, uh, so yeah, just wanted to add that. Thank you, Commissioner Bozo. Good to see you as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gold. Hi there, and thank you. Uh, it does seem to be uh, both an interesting project and uh, something that will create so much needed housing. I've spent a little bit of time in the area. I'm just curious, just going to the parking for a second, because that seems to be the, uh, you know, the, the issue. Um, can you just speak for a second about the public transportation options um, in, in the area? Um, I'm sort of less familiar, but it, 
doesn't they don't seem to be um, that readily available just just so that I guess we can understand better just the need for that parking um, you know if it's actually necessary because I know, I know there's some dissension there there are several bus lines that service Spring Creek. Um, mm -hmm. There are at least three or four bus lines towards the eastern end of the development and um, two or three towards the northern end of the development. There are no trains that really stop here, but you can take a, a bus to the train. Um, and then it's maybe about two blocks away from uh, getting on the, the Belt Parkway. Yeah, that's that piece of it um, I've seen closely. Um, and then um, part two. So if the, the parking is not for the staff, um, so it seems it's for the visitors. Is that uh, the right way to think about it? Or, or uh, for folks as they're uh, coming in, joining? Is that, is that so the, the use of it? The, the proposed, the idea or the proposed use is for residents um, and for the spaces to be allotted via a lottery um, once we've leased up all of our units. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do think you have that balance, but it does sound and from you know, having seen the neighborhood, it does it does seem to be a need for it. So uh, it's just a question of, I guess, figuring out as effectively as possible, it seems. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, giving a final chance here for um, Commissioner questions to the applicant team uh, before we... Uh, Take a look at uh, public testimony, which I do not see any of at the moment. Um, so we're going to give a final call for commissioners and also for members of the public here who uh, may wish to testify. <clears throat> okay, seeing none, uh, we're going to close the hearing on calendar numbers 19 and 20. Thank you uh, to the applicant team uh, for your work on this uh, and uh, we will um, move on to our next item, Madam Secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Borough of Queens, calendar number 21, Cambria Heights, 222nd Street, CD 13, N230007 HKQ. Public hearing and the matter of a uh, communication concerning the historic district designation for Cambria Heights, 222nd Street. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let me call the applicant team here. Okay, I, um, give me one sec. Uh, there, there is no applicant team. So this okay. is the, um, this is the, the, just the, just the landmark landmarks. Committee. Yeah, we had the presentation yeah. on this on Monday. So. Okay, so we, so we do, we are, um, so is this a, so Ryan, what's the opportunity here for this one? So there, this was open for speakers, this and the next item. I um, see, got it. So this is just, speakers. this is, this, there's nothing, nothing to hear beyond what we heard on. That's right. Uh, okay, my apologies. There is nobody here. So That's we right. are calling the item. We're looking for public testimony. There's no additional um, presentation from, uh, right. uh, from the applicant team, which in this case uh, was a presentation on Monday from the Landmarks Commission. Uh, final call for members of the public on Cambria Heights um, districts. Uh, that's our calendars number 21, 22. Seeing none, we will close the hearing and move on to calendar number 23, 24. Madam Secretary, please go ahead and, and call this item. 20, uh, Borough Queens, calendar numbers 23 through 33. Innovation Queens rezoning and LSGD. CD1, calendar number 23, C220364ZMQ. Calendar number 24, C. Uh, N220367 ZRQ, calendar number 25, C220370 ZSQ, calendar number 26, C220331 ZSQ, calendar number 27, C220372 ZSQ, calendar number 28, C220373 ZSQ, calendar number 29, C220374 ZSQ, calendar number 30, C220365 ZSQ, calendar number 31, C220366 ZSQ, calendar number 32, C220368 ZSQ. Calendar number 33, C220369ZSQ. Public hearing and the matter of an application for a zoning map and zoning text amendments and special permits concerning Innovation Queens rezoning and LSGD. Notice, 
a public hearing is being held um, by the City Planning Commission in conjunction with the above Euler hearings to receive comments related to a draft environmental impact statement. The hearing is being held um, pursuant to State Environmental Quality Review Act and the City Environmental Quality Review. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I will note um, uh, again that, uh, that we have translation services available for those I would like to use them to participate uh, in Spanish, Bengali, Mandarin, and Greek. Uh, so um, uh, you uh, can sign up to testify as you have heard previously at nyc.gov forward slash engage, and there's gonna be an option to choose a preferred language. So with that, I am going to, be, to call the applicant team uh, here. Uh, and this team includes the following, Tracy Capoon, Jesse Mazur, Lan La Lung, Philip Habib, Lynn Doe, Jameson Dival, Gerald Johnson, Alex Lieber, Michael Unsicker, Brian Collins, Jay Martin, Stephen Lee, and Nazish Tisha, a significant group of people. I feel like uh, I feel like we're on a jury duty. Uh, okay, let's go. We've got the, we've got the applicant team. We know, when, whenever you all are are settled and ready, uh, you may go right ahead and uh, get started. You have ten minutes, uh, and I will note that in contrast to our other two items of the day, we do have members of the public wishing to testify on this item. Uh, so we will turn to you all uh, after the, the applicant team and after questions to the applicant team. So whenever you all are ready, you may proceed. Mr. Chair, this is Brian Collins from Silverstein Properties. Um, I'm one of the e easy names to pronounce. So I, think, I thought you did a very good job. <laughs> Thank, <there>. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, <laughs> um, I'm EVP and Director of Development with Silverstein. Uh, Silverstein, Kaufman Astoria Studios, and Bedrock Real Estate are the team proposing innovation queens. Uh, next slide, please. And we can go through a couple of slides here. So that's the existing conditions from an aerial point of view. Next slide, please. Keep going. Development overview. Uh, next slide, please. So that is the existing um, site. And we'll go to the next slide. After discussions with community members, uh, Innovation Queens built its design around delivering two acres of public open space of this area that, we, that could use green space. It's one of the most underserved areas in the city. We've included public open space on each of the five blocks, visually linked and designed to meet a variety of needs, including a children's play area, a large civic park adjacent to an enhancing playground 35, a large community innovation hub, and a covered space for outdoor markets and other events. Next slide, please. Innovation Queens also make, made including community serving organizations a driving principle of our proposal. We made commitments early in the process, long before we were certified into Euler, and we are proud of our diverse and accomplished community partners. Um, we look forward to working with Hannock as our affordable housing administrator and our and on building new affordable and senior housing in Astoria, creating space for the floating hospital to operate a medical and dental clinic with access to social services and daycare that is free for all, providing digital gallery space for the Museum of Moving Image, allowing them to expand their digital arts education programming. And in the Community Innovation Hub, the LGBT network will offer business incubator programming and its leadership academy. Urban Upbound will house its entrepreneurship and financial literacy programming. Queens Public Library will have a new tech lab that provides intermediate to advanced tech training to all ages. And Jacob Reese Neighborhood Settlement will offer immigrant services and after school programming. Next slide, please. Um, we've also partnered with 32BJ, committing to union jobs and are party to the Rebney Building Trades Agreement, which levels the playing field and commits to giving the union subcontractors a fair shot to all of the construction contracted innovation queens. You can see here the proposed massing um, of our development. Um, in addition to the two acres of public space, our proposal would create a mixed use development with 250,000 square feet of new tech and office space, 100,000 square feet of community facility space, and over 2,800 new homes, which at least 25% or 711 will be permanently affordable. Next slide, please. 
We are also prepared to make significant efforts to promote sustainability, including project-wide initiatives like geothermal energy, um, electrical vehicle, charging stations, green roofs, stormwater reuse, and promoting alternative transportation methods. Um, we will also commit to all of the buildings being 100% electric. Um, and with that, I will turn you to over to Jesse Mazur, our land use uh, council, to discuss the particulars of our proposal. Jesse? Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, my name is Jesse Mazur, and along with Jerry Johnson, we are Land Use Council to the applicant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on Monday, you were given a very competent and exhaustive uh, presentation by staff as to our project. And so therefore, in the spirit of a time limitation, I will try not to be repetitive to those issues. But of course, we are prepared to answer any and all questions the commission may have. The start is of my presentation today by repeating a little bit what Brian said about open space, because I think it's significant to point this out as part of our land use application. In, in over the past number of years, this community has had a number of rezoning applications, uh, which have been approved and are certainly appropriate. Uh, but what singularly identifies most of them, if with a few exceptions, is that they were all approved without any public open space. Uh, we felt that this neighborhood in our studies was one of the, proved to us what was known by the members of the community for much longer than us, is that this is one of the most public open space deprived neighborhoods in the city of New York. And for that reason, we dedicated 25%, an unprecedented number of our privately owned land to be public open space maintained by us but open to the public. So while rezonings at similar densities have been approved, they have not been approved with this degree of open space. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a summary of the zoning actions that we bring before you. They, they fall into three large buckets, obviously. One is the zoning map amendment. Most of this land is zoned at a very, very low M11 current and a small amount of C42. And this is to change to an MX district with a variety of choices, which we will show you a little bit further on. Initially, there's a zoning text amendment to create the MX district, to map the, the inclusionary housing, and to give the ability to weigh the loading uh, requirements that we'll go into a little further detail. And finally, a series of special permits uh, under a large scale, which would waive bulk, give a sign regulation waiver pertaining to the movie theater. Uh, because of the quirkiness of its location and a small distribution of parking spaces throughout the entire project, uh, relocating them to certain other parking garages within the location. And finally, as I mentioned before, to modify the loading dock requirements. And finally, uh, uh, large scale retail establishment, which we will speak of greater detail as we go on. Next slide, please. Finally, it shows you uh, the area on your left of the large scale and on the right showing you, and I'm not large scale, excuse me, of the rezoning and on the right showing you the zoning districts that are being proposed. Next slide, please. And this is a greater detail showing a variety of the zoning districts, which we notice the higher density on the wide streets, lower density in the mid block and the narrow street conditions, typical of rezonings that the commission has done over the years. Next slide, please. Again, this shows you a bit a greater view. I wanted to show, demonstrate to you the integration of the open space within the development. Again, we think the public open space is a unique opportunity to address a longstanding problem in this area. Of course, the biggest longstanding problem in this area we know is the housing crisis we are suffering in the city and particularly on the affordable housing area. Next slide, please. This is this shows you the large scale waiver we're seeking, which we're going to talk about modifying in a moment. But I want to sp speak a moment about large scale, which is we don't see this as destination shopping, large scale, big box kind of development, not at all. Uh, and you see from the, the geometry of our, our project, th th there's no place to put large scale. But why are we seeking this waiver is because one, we want to have a food store a grocery, which would require such a waiver in an M1 district. And finally, we have a, an existing 
a retail tenant, PC Richards, which will need to be relocated and similarly would need that relief. Next slide, please. So we were at the community board and as part of that process, you have their recommendations, but we also, we have the land use committee at public hearing address their concerns about the land use actions and scope of the project. And we'd like to go through that and tell you what our reactions have been to date. So next slide, please. First, it had to do with bulk and particularly the community board land use committee was concerned about the adjacency that we have to the existing residential development along 30, on th adjacent to 35th Avenue uh, and wanted a greater transition uh, that we could make to reduce height, to have a greater transition between our development and the existing residential. And so if you can go to the next slide, this is what Brian showed you a minute ago as our proposal that was certified by the commission. And the next is our proposed, next slide, is what we are proposing. So you see on site E, closest to Northern Boulevard, a reduction down to eight floors. On site D, we eliminated the residential building, 16 stories completely, that, that was sitting over the retail cinema that we've taken away. And additionally on block C, we reduced the tower there down to 24 floors. And on block B, we took five floors off to, to reduce it to 17 floors. This is somewhat, was, was our reaction to the community board, but I think also helps address the chair's concern yesterday about the buildings surrounding the significant open space on block C. Uh, so instead of setbacks, we've reduced height, if you will. Next slide. There was concern uh, by expressed by the chair of the, community, of the land use committee and other members that Hi. the open space what you, felt was you're 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 at time you're at time, Mr. Major. Let me just ask you to, to finish up on because I, I I do want to hear how you have addressed um, uh, community board concerns. So please do do that. Uh, we certainly would have asked you about it. So please do finish that one up, but then we're going to move to general questions. Okay. Uh, uh, it, it had to do with the, the commercialization of open space and the lack of active recreation space. Uh, so next slide. I was trying to get quickly through this, Mr. Chairman. Next slide, please. But this just demonstrates to you that uh, over 70% of the frontage of all of our public open space is not adjacent to retail. There's some exceptions where we are adjacent to restaurants and food opportunities. We thought that that was compatible. Next slide. Uh, this had to do with lack of recreation, active recreation open space, which is also uh, was identified as an impact of the project in our secret findings. So next slide. So what we have proposed is at the end of block A to produce 13,000 square feet of open active recreation space and perhaps as significant to create a 30,000 square foot indoor recreation facility. In addition, we continue to work with your staff to find other opportunities in our existing open space to activate them to more active recreation. Uh, we believe the result of this will be the elimination of that impact. Uh, next slide, I'm just about to finish, Mr. Chairman. Next slide, please. Uh, had to do again, as they related to the big box waiver and as what we have agreed in the next slide is we would only seek to use this in, if we get to the next slide, if we can, could use this to accommodate the food store that's on block B and perhaps on block D and E to relocate of PC research. Uh, the last impact of the community board, which I guess we're not gonna get to speak to or more about it, was a concern about greater affordability opportunities, although the community would not specify a number. Uh, we felt that there were two issues on affordability. It had to do with the lowering of AMI eligibility and the total amount of affordability. And had we had the time, I would have asked uh, Jay Martin of Bedrock to speak to that uh, as to what our response is, but I don't know if we have any more. All right, time. Mr. Mazur, I am certain you will get a question on that. Uh, so let's just hold that for the moment. And I'm okay. going gonna, gonna to defer to my colleagues and I'm, and I'm certain 
uh, and I, 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 I could certainly do it here, but I don't want to uh, 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 take all of the time, but I, because I do have a few questions uh, on the things you have said already, and then I will, uh, I'll leave it to one of my colleagues to, to probe the affordability point, because I'm certain uh, that they will. Um, okay, very, very quickly from me. Um, let, let me, let me just start off by saying, um, you know, we, we have been following this process all along, uh, recognize the complex, complexity of the site and also the process. Um, but I also think it's worth noting that there is a big investment that is, uh, you know, attempting to be made here in New York City, which is something that is worth recognizing and uh, appreciating. So I know that that is, um, you know, something that, uh, uh, has not been uh, central to this uh, to, the, to the conversation, but I do want to note. Obviously, there's a lot of risk being taken uh, in an effort to try to do something uh, significant here. So let's talk about some of the details um, on mitigating the active open space. So, uh, as I understand it, based on what you just said, Mr. Mazur, you are looking at 13,000 square feet of space along 36th Avenue um, and a 30,000 square foot sports and rec center. Where? Where is the, um, where, where are you in the, 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 the process of adding that sports and rec center to that site in a way that we could consider it as mitigation for uh, the active space impact um, in the environmental review? Well, the, the, I would sort of a two-part answer, if you will, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one is we're looking to actually increase the amount of outdoor active recreation space and are working with your staff. And we have, a number, as we showed you, a number of open spaces already, and we can see that activating those. We are committed uh, to the indoor recreation space as part of this project, and we will submit our plans uh, to modify our application shortly on, with that regard. Okay. Um, I do happen to think that the, you know, the best, my view, best location for that active space is uh, you know, separate and apart from the um, sports recreation facility is where you are proposing it at the uh, end of the block. I think that is the site where it is, it is best suited. Um, uh, talk to me about parking. Um, as, we, uh, uh, as we heard in our review session on Monday, uh, there's a, uh, a number of um, parking spaces that are required the proposal goes above that. It was a, roughly a 900 versus a 1300 or so. Help us with the justification for that. The justification is really one driven by demand. In our studies, what we believed would be the, the reasonable demand created by the retail, the movie theater particularly is a heavy user in the food store that we're trying to accommodate that, you, that, that demand and not create an impact. Uh, for many years, uh, I've been involved in doing land use in Queens. Uh, Steinway Street Merchant Association, as you know, and particularly the bid, have always been concerned about a sufficiency of parking to make their retail uh, strip viable and, and, and active. Uh, so we don't want to have a parking impact that in any way diminishes the parking opportunity for the merchants. So we wanted to err on the side of having sufficient amount of parking to handle our demand. So while yes, you're absolutely right, as, of course, uh, Mr. Chairman, about the, the zoning requirement, we have exceeded the zoning requirement at a great expense to us. As you know, parking is very expensive to build and is not in this area seen as a profit center at all. It's seen as meeting the demand of the application and the development. So you, you view the parking as mostly to accommodate the needs of the the retail, movie theater, uh, large large scale stores, et cetera. Is that is that well, and as well as you know, we are we are producing a historic amount of housing here, uh, and there will be a certain demand for you know this twenty seven hundred units of housing is quite a bit of units, and, and, and we expect there will be a parking demand there. Okay, let's talk about the, um, the, on a couple of the slides, and I noted this on Monday, and I just wanted to see if you or someone on the team can walk us through the 15-minute city uh, <laughs> component in the bottom left-hand corner of a couple of the slides that were presented, um, and just help me make sense of them. Uh, they may be very illustrative, but I, I you know, I, I'm not sure that I understand it, and uh, so if you could, if you could do that. I would certainly appreciate it. 
I, I fear that we all needed a security clearance to understand that slide. Uh, it, what, what it was trying to demonstrate, it probably was mislabeled, it wasn't demonstrating the 15 minute city. But what it was really demonstrating was the activity on the site. So you could see we're trying to have a, we don't want to have a development that is dark and uninviting at any period of time. And so what you're seeing in that slide is the various uses and their activity. And that's why you see the open space, very active almost until midnight and the other uses. So that's what you're seeing in that 15 minute sort of graph is the activity created by various uses and therefore demonstrating that this will be a live and active development. Okay, so I'm not gonna focus too much on the detail of that. It sounds like it's on there, but that's not really the central point of this whole operation. But the key here, the key takeaway is activating this area in a way that has a variety of uses throughout the course of the day. Is that, a, is that what? A absolutely. Okay. And that's right. to the open space and the commercial use. Okay. And before I go to my colleagues, I just want to note, you know, you are, um, the, the efforts to move some of the density toward Northern, Northern Boulevard is a, um, that's a sentiment that, uh, that I certainly share. And I know that that's something that came up with the community board and that you are uh, working uh, to address. I just want to just say out loud that I think that that is the right move here. Uh, and uh, we certainly look forward to uh, continuing that conversation with you and the team. Um, let me go to uh, the vice chairman, Mr. Knuckles. Thank you, chair. Uh, I did want to follow up on the affordability question uh, specifically. I think uh, the borough president and his recommendation uh, uh, advocated for that 50% of the units be uh, affordable, quote unquote. And I wanted to hear the development team's uh, response to that recommendation. Vice Chair Knuckles, I'm gonna ask uh, Jay Martin, who's principal in Bedrock, one of our developer partners here, to uh, speak to that, if, if he may. Uh, thank you for the question, Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, we share the sentiment that I think everyone uh, involved in this uh, have to create more affordable housing and more deeply affordable housing. That's something that is uh, a product of the housing crisis we find ourselves in in this city. And so uh, to specifically answer your question regarding the borough president's recommendation, uh, we are actively working with various stakeholders right now uh, to deliver additional affordable homes uh, at a meaningful number at deeply affordable income levels. Uh, those conversations are ongoing. Uh, and I assure you, I can show you the chart of what is uh, incorporated into the plan today, but it's, it's slide 28, if that could be pulled up. Uh, but uh, we fully expect at, uh, as this process progresses uh, that there will be more affordable units as a part of this project uh, and more deeply affordable. But I what I would like to say is baked into this project already are 711 permanently affordable homes uh, in an area, in a, a group of sites where virtually no housing exists today. Uh, the, our racial equity report found that since 2014, in this community district, only 1,003 affordable apartments have been created or preserved uh, during that eight year period. This project alone will increase that number by 70%, which is why the racial equity report found uh, that this project uh, would uh, be a benefit to uh, the New Yorkers most in need of housing. And so um, what this chart shows is our current program, which is 10% of our units at 40% AMI, six, at another 10% of our units at 60% AMI, and the re remaining 5% at 100% AMI. Uh, that results in rents with studios starting at $715 a month, one bedroom starting at $903 a month, two bedrooms at $1,071 a month, uh, and three bedrooms starting at $1,225 a month. In total, 540 apartments will be available under $1,675 a month, and that includes 200 family-sized two- and three-bedroom apartments. But we absolutely uh, will do more than this. This is truly just the start, and the conversations are ongoing, and so I believe everyone we'll be happy at the end of this process that we've done a lot more than what you see on the screen here. And HBD is of course at the table uh, with these yes, discussions. All, 
uh, all all relevant stakeholders, including HPD. Yes, uh, Chairman Nichols. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Let me go to Commissioner Rampershad. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Vice Chair Nichols asked the exact question I was going to ask, and that was based upon the Borough President's uh, recommendations. I have a few questions. Sorry, Raj. <laughs> thank you. Um, two questions I have is besides to the community board, what other community outreach or organizations did you guys reach out to when presenting these projects, this project? Jay, you respond? Oh, sorry, I believe Tracy Capune, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to answer if she's not available. Or Jay. Oh, uh, so. Uh, the uh, the number is uh, outstanding. I mean, we pro uh, we prepared a list uh, previously. I believe it's almost 200 uh, organizations and small businesses that we've met with. I know I personally have probably presented to 80 or more uh, uh, community-based organizations. Uh, you know, uh, from all kinds of uh, involved in all kinds of service offerings, programming, and what you see baked into this project is. Uh, these long-standing community-based organizations, many of them will have permanent homes within the project, but most importantly, uh, we've created an innovation hub, a community hub, where uh, community-based organizations that aren't formally a part of the project will have access to classroom space, um, uh, event space, and uh, places to provide programming on a temporary basis. And so uh, we really are trying to bring into the project uh, existing community organizations uh, that could benefit from uh, that might have a need in one area or another and provide resources uh, for them. And, and so uh, we could certainly provide to the City Planning Commission uh, a list, uh, but uh, it, I can tell you it's almost 200 organizations and businesses long. I would like to see that. Uh, also, I know you said you're working on the affordable, the number of units that will be affordable. You're looking forward to increase. Um, I look forward to seeing that. Can you speak to some of the sustainable measures that can be used as part of this overall design? Sure, I'll turn it over to Jameson Duvall from Silverstein uh, who can uh, speak to that. I, I can take that one, Jay. Um, thank you, Commissioner, for the question. So one of the um, initiatives we're most proud of is uh, we've been involved in a feasibility study with NYSERDA on providing geothermal energy across the entire site. Uh, one of the um, really important elements of geothermal is having the space to implement it. And so, you know, land area is obviously at a premium in cities like New York. And so the ability to have this large area gives us a, a high likelihood of providing that. We're also looking at doing a tremendous amount of um, green space at, at grade, as you saw in the two plus acres of, of open space, which will help with stormwater retention and reuse, uh, as well as highly energy efficient buildings, all electric buildings. And we've also been looking at different ways to, I know there was a lot of discussion about parking, um, trying to promote alternative methods of, methods of transportation as well. Um, so we're working with our, our traffic consultants and ways to consolidate loading docks, provide safer passage for pedestrians and for bikes um, and to improve traffic patterns. So um, we're, we're actively looking at pursuing different elements of sustainability measures across the entire five blocks. Okay, Chair, I just have two quick questions, then I'll stop and let all the <laughs> commissioners ask. Go ahead, that's I, all right. I, I'm glad uh, on the last slide, during this presentation, you were showing around the playground, I guess on block D and block B, you're reducing the heights, I guess from 16 stories to eight stories. I don't know if we can pull back up that slide and the 22 story building is going to drop to 17. Do you guys have a shadow diagram that you can provide to us based upon these new heights that you're proposing just to see how it uh, impacts not only the blocks uh, further, uh, I believe it's south of there, but also the playground as well. And one last question I had was, can you just speak to the tenant displacement and the phasing of this job, if it should go through, how it would work? Like, for example, you're saying PC Richard would be relocated to another block. How would that work? Can you just walk us through the steps, how you envision it? Let me, I'll try to answer the shadow question and turn over to my colleagues on the others. Uh, as part of the CEQA and the environmental review, there is a shadow study, uh, which we can share, have shared with you as part of the DEIS or now 
hoping to become an FEIS. Uh, we have not done a shadow study to see the impact of the reduction in height. Uh, we can do that and send that on to you. Thank you. Uh, as to relocation, I would like to ask Jay Martin to speak about tenant relocation. And I think it's Jameson would be helpful in discussing phasing. Yeah, so uh, as it relates to residential tenant uh, tenants, there are a total of six apartments, uh, not apartment buildings, but six apartments within the overall project area. And so we are working with the residents of all six apartments. I've met with many of them uh, personally uh, on relocating, giving them an opportunity to return you know, at their option uh, into the development when it's completed. I'll turn it over to uh, Jameson uh, to address the commercial uh, relocation. So PC Richard and the cinema are two of the existing businesses that we're in active conversations with um, about relocating to specific areas on the site. Uh, we've been in conversations with many of the other businesses about their interest in, in relocating um, in the site as well. A lot of the existing businesses are actually uh, short-term month-to-month storage space. And so th those are um, those tenants have been less interested in relocating due to the, you know, the nature of the space that will be forthcoming. So it's a very wide variety, but we are in active conversations with all of them. And in terms of the phasing, what we have proposed is to, is to uh, produce blocks C and D as the initial phase, C uh, having the largest public open space and the 60,000 square foot community innovation hub as part of the initial phase, and D, which has the uh, the new movie theater. So those would be the two uh, first two blocks that we would propose to produce and then blocks A and B following that and the final one to be block E along Northern Boulevard. Uh, thank you. I'll let my colleagues uh, ask the rest of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, let me go to Commissioner Goodrich. I just had a quick follow up question about um, it was mentioned, obviously, that you're looking into increasing the affordable housing units. And my question was really the timeline of that. Uh, I asked because we had a similar project that sounds very similar, but a different borough. Um, and, uh, you know, same, you know, green building, all of these other things. But the community was very insistent that their main grievance was you know, the, the number of affordable units and there was a, some negotiation, but at the, you know, the, the very last minute, which obviously impacted the success of the project. So my question to you is, you know, um, the when of like, what's, what goes into the timeline of increasing the affordable housing units? When do you think that that might happen, if at all? Uh, it, it will happen, and I can assure you it will happen before the city council vote, but I can't uh, specifically identify when the discussions will conclude. Uh, obviously, we, we'd frankly like to conclude discussions sooner rather than later because we'd love to report to the community and to the city planning commission and uh, the city uh, what we've agreed with all the relevant stakeholders, uh, but I just I can't predict when it will come to rest, but I assure you it will come to rest and it will be uh, a, a meaningful uh, uh, amount of affordable housing above MIH option one and we will have deeply affordable uh, housing for extremely low income uh, uh, bands, uh, you know, available for families that really need it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Goodrich, do you have, you have any follow-up? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Jesse. Um, I realize you, you started this process prior to the expiration of the uh, 421A program. And I'm wondering what impact the expiration will have on your project and your timeline on, on the uh, underwriting and feasibility of the project financial feasibility of the project. I'm going to let Brian Collins uh, from Silverstein really answer that because he doesn't <laughs> want to. Uh, but I mean, I'll give you the short answer, Commissioner. It has a very, very significant impact. And 
you know, I think every developer would tell you the same thing. It's it's questioning the viability of residential rental development. Uh, we are hopeful that there'll be some resolution, but we have we have to go back and look at what the underwriting means. And I think Brian will give you a much more intelligent answer than I ever could. I, I actually don't know that I can expand much on what Jesse has said. The, the advantage we have in this project is that it's a mixed use project. And so obviously uh, the community uh, spaces and the commercial don't rely on 421A, but 421A is a important, important part of, of um, the, the financial underwriting. It also, you know, the other piece that wouldn't necessarily be impacted by, by 421A is the additional affordable units, which are likely to be financed with the help of HPD. So those conversations are happening simultaneously and go back to the last question about timing. You know, there's the HPD conversations, there's, you know, there's, there's uh, conversations with um, ongoing conversations, with community board and the borough president and with the, and the council member. So all those things are happening simultaneously. Um, um, and so the timing is in the next, what, 60, 90 days is when the Euler clock sets it forth. Um, the 421A makes it a real challenge and we'd probably end up um, looking at the non-market rate, or I'm sorry, say it differently, the non-mixed income buildings first, hoping that 421A is, is or some form of 421A is reenacted uh, in the future. So, so your phasing would be different based on it or 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 we it might be the same blocks but all affordable buildings instead of mixed income buildings in those early blocks uh, until 421a or some predecessor successor so our passed. concern or well, my concern i should say is that once if approved and whatever modifications are to the pro through, through the process um it becomes an as of right project and uh my concern is that without the 421A uh, pro program, a lot of this doesn't get built the way it's proposed, but not from any fault of your own, just simply you relied on those in your underwriting and it, it, it's not there. So how, well, how we, have no, we have no ability to get around whatever, whatever ends up being agreed upon in terms of, of affordable housing. We've already agreed to, there's a minimum of 25% or 711 permanently affordable homes. There's no way we can get around that. If we agree in subsequent negotiations to a bigger number, we won't be able to avoid that. Um, and so I don't see any real risk that we're not going to do a significant amount of affordable housing on this on this project. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bozarg. Hi, thank you um, for the presentation. Um, some of my questions were answered um, by Jay and Jesse um, around the housing. I was curious if you're talking to HPD, not just on the MIH, MIH side, but uh, to use their financing tools to go, you know, do more um, affordable housing sounds like you are, um, which is great. Um, I was curious, I have a couple other questions. One is on some of the modifications, Jesse, that you walked through, um, is there an actual unit count reduction that's resulting from that or is the bulk just being moved around? No, there, there is no unit count reduction. Okay, okay that's good. Um, and then, you know, just on, I know often this question of going deeper and doing more affordable housing, which is a really important question is often a question of financial feasibility. And Jesse, you mentioned the cost of parking. So it'd be remiss not to say, you know, these things are related. And I know there's a calculated demand that that's um, felt to be there both by potential future residents and by people visiting retail uses. But um, do you think feeding that demand should not necessarily be prioritized over, you know, providing more financing to do um, more affordable housing on this site. So I hope that's something um, that's being taken into consideration um, in it, terms of priorities. It certainly is, Commissioner. I mean, as I said earlier, we we have always been very sensitive to our our, our already built environment and don't want to create an impact, uh, particularly now, right now, you know, local retail, as you know, is very challenging. Uh, there's a great vacancy rate and we don't want to make it more stressful. So we've been an extremely sensitive perspective neighbor. I mean, some of us are already neighbors. I mean, Kaufman exists in this neighborhood as an essential partner in Astoria. So we, we're very sensitive to that, but we'll take that under consideration for sure, Commissioner. Okay. 
thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Osorio, Commissioner Osorio. Thank you. Thanks so much for your presentation uh, and for your responses to the questions. Uh, they've been very useful to further understand the work that has been carried out uh, following the comments from the community board and the borough president. So building on Commissioner Rampershat's question on the risk of displacement, I was wondering if you can expand a little bit on, on how is the project really sort of taking a comprehensive um, take on some of the recommendations that specifically are asking for a, a plan, basically a, how I read it is a reinvestment plan to give back to the community. The uh, Queens Board President is asking for a small business grant fund. I would like to know whether this extends to, or how does this relate to the industrial business zone that is adjacent to the project. There's also a recommendation to, for creating a community development fund um, so that's, that's kind of the first question. And, and then the second question, you know, I, I, I wanted to take a minute to commend you for considering geothermal. Uh, I think that you also, you know, are incorporating interesting um, strategies around, around the, the potential green roofs uh, that you described in the presentation. But I wanted to hear whether or not or to what extent you've considered solar opportunities. Um, and most importantly, really, how do these infrastructure improvements and the energy savings that will result from that uh, respond to this proposed uh, community reinvestment plan or opportunities to give back to the community. Um, and, and sort of going back to Commissioner Rampershat's question in the context of adjacent high risk displacement areas, both in terms of residential and commercial, uh, particularly businesses uh, of color. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to speak to a little bit of your question, and I think uh, some of our team members will speak to others. I, I, I want to speak to Borough President's recommendations briefly. Uh, while they were not necessarily land use uh, recommendations, uh, but they are a part of a broader discussion about any development that takes place. Uh, essentially, the answer is we find no friction between us and the Borough President on his recommendations. We think uh, they are both appropriate uh, and we look forward to participating in uh, community participation and help funding those actions. Uh, as what they have to do with adjacent industrial business zones, I don't think they really speak to that. I think they speak about our, our project and what we can do to, as you, to use your phrase, Commissioner, to give back to the community. Broadly speaking, about when you say give back to the community, I think you heard earlier, very, the very beginning of our presentation by Brian, is how we have linked up with the existing community facilities within our community. And so, as an, just as one example of many examples uh, with regard to the floating hospital, uh, which is a very essential healthcare giver currently in this area of Astoria, an ability to expand at no cost to them. We're at a very significant cost to us, obviously. We have to build the space. We have to have the land to build it on. To, so that's part of our overall spirit about giving back and being integrated into the community. With regard to questions of solar and infrastructure, you'll never want to hear a land use lawyer speak to that. And so to that extent, I think the developer is much more competent to speak to it since I don't really, that's, outside my lane, Commissioner. And so, and Brian, uh, Jameson, if you'd like to speak to infrastructure, I think that would be helpful to respond to the Commissioner's question. Sure. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner. No, no, just, just before we move on, I just wanted to cl a, a clarification question. So, so you're saying that you're agreeing to the recommendations from the Borough President regarding the creation of these funds? Oh, we, we believe we can work that out with the Borough President, yes, sir. Thanks. So um, specific to your question about solar, we, we have done some initial studies um, with, a, with our consultant who is also doing our analysis on the geothermal about solar. Um, we haven't dug really deep into those studies so far because we, with residential buildings like this, there's not a tremendous amount of, of area for solar panels. So it has less of, a, um, of, an, uh, of an, uh, an efficient effect on delivering energy, but once the buildings are, are in the design process, we will certainly continue to look at options for solar within the buildings themselves. But we've really been um, most focused on the geothermal energy, which provides the largest amount of, uh, of available sustainable energy to, to the project area. 
And Commissioner Osorio, I wanted to address uh, sort of the two part displacement question. I think you were asking about displacement of businesses in the area and then displacement, secondary displacement of residents outside of the footprint of the project. As it relates to the small businesses that surround the project site, uh, our studies show that the project will generate $50 million, $50 million annually in uh, revenue outside of the project area, which is a benefit to all the small businesses uh, that surround the site. In fact, we've met with many of them up and down Steinway Street, 34th Avenue, Broadway. People are excited about uh, re-energizing uh, these retail corridors with the foot traffic that this project will bring with the workers, with the residents, and the people attending, uh, you know, going to the retail shops and going to the community services and offerings uh, that the project will have. Uh, as it relates to the residential, uh, uh, the potential for residential secondary displacement, uh, our racial equity report found that 61% of the renter occupied uh, units uh, surrounding this project are either income restricted already or subject to rent stabilization. And on top of that figure, you have one and two family uh, households, which are pretty typical in this area uh, that often are owner occupied. And so uh, it's not to say that, uh, that this issue is not a real one, uh, that we also share uh, concern, uh, but, uh, but there is a certain level of protection of the existing community and again, we're talking about an area where virtually no housing, our project sites where virtually no housing exists, and we are creating 2,800 um, new homes, including over 700 permanently affordable homes uh, in a city that's facing a housing crisis. And while it's not a panacea for the housing crisis, uh, uh, adding more housing supply in a area, these two um, council districts uh, adjacent to the project have a 2% and a 2.8% vacancy rate. And so adding more supply uh, can help to alleviate the upward pressure on rent. Uh, and so I just uh, would address that issue in that way. Thank you, I appreciate it. Chair Gardner, can I ask you a quick follow-up question? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that that response. I mean, I guess the, the, the point that I was trying to make is that a, what is the relationship to industrial businesses and industrially sold land in one of the sort of like an important pocket that remains. I, I will, I will, my question is really about the response on the sustainability uh, improvements. Again, uh, kudos on exploring geothermal and, and, and considering uh, solar to some extent. But I, I wanted to know whether the open space design um, has uh, received any additional uh, analysis in terms of how well or to what extent it is responding to extreme heat and unequal access to cool and green spaces in, in an area that is that is uh, uh, a high risk in, in the world. Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. And Jesse, Jesse, I don't know if uh, Stephen Lee is on too. I don't know if he could be promoted from SWA Balsley, who's our landscape architect. Um, but the SWA Balsley did an extensive analysis of the neighborhood and the different types of open spaces that exist, the few that there are to determine or to come up with a proposal on what types of open spaces could be provided. And you will and you can see from um, many of our renderings, which we could actually pull up um, if you would like us to, that show the openness of these spaces to the sidewalks and the street, many of them um, considered to be shaded with seating and, and grassy areas um, to provide you know, fully public access to different types of open spaces throughout all five blocks. So I, we haven't done an analysis that I know of specifically to how these open spaces will uh, quantitatively affect sort of the heat island effect, but I think Stephen might be able to speak to that a little bit more probably uh, qualitatively based on their designs. Sure, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Stephen Lee, um, landscape architect uh, for the project. Yes, we've, we've been, um, as Jamison said, we did a thorough analysis of the existing open spaces within the neighborhood and made sure that programmatically what we were proposing would really kind of complement that existing inventory and provide new amenities um, that are not kind of replicating what's already there, but providing ones that support the community and provide additional new kinds of amenities that don't exist. Um, and I think when you look at the design of the open spaces, we really thoughtfully considered the kind of balance between hardscape and softscape 
you're taking a site that's essentially 100% um, hardscape today, and we've added a significant quantity of softscape and planted areas, while considering the need for you know, circulation and active spaces um, that will better serve the community. So I think you'll see, if you look at the designs of the open spaces, that there is a significant amount of uh, greenery, of plantings, of, of shade trees that have been established that will certainly help to mitigate the urban heat island effect. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Let's go to uh, Commissioner Marin. Chair Garodnik, thank you. Um, team, thank you for your presentation. My question is based on a response that Mr. Collins gave to Raj Rampa, to our Commissioner Rampashad, and it's based uh, on the affordable housing unit. So uh, I believe I heard that the affordable units are going to be segregated into their own buildings and not mixed in with the market rate units. Is that correct? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Commissioner Marin. This is uh, Jay Martin with Bedrock Real Estate Partners. I'll jump in. Uh, our MIH uh, units will be fully integrated into the uh, uh, housing of the project's housing. So uh, to be very clear, um, uh, the affordable 711 per permanently affordable housing units will be integrated into our general residential program. Uh, Brian was uh, answering a question uh, relating to if we end up doing as we expect to do uh, more affordable housing than what MIH requires, uh, uh, that may be under uh, uh, HPD programs uh, that the financing mechanisms require that uh, they be in their standalone buildings. But those will complement uh, the uh, mixed income buildings that'll be the remainder of the project. It's possible, would it be, would it if allowable, is it possible to integrate them into the rest of the development once you know what the funding is? Uh, we can explore it. Um, our understanding of how many of these programs work is that the financing mechanisms uh, typically require standalone buildings. But again, the remainder of the project will be mixed income. There are not gonna be any fully market rate buildings. Uh, every building in the project will have uh, units available that are deeply affordable. I strongly suggest that you take a look at those HPD term sheets because there have been many projects that have been brought to us, one standalone building with many, many forms of HPD financing, Sarah, Ella. So I, I, would, I would urge you to take a look at that and I encourage you to mix all the units within the entire development and not segregate any out. We can do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rampershad. Yes, uh, thank you. Just uh, one follow-up question. So Commissioner Marin actually just brought up a point I was going to also bring up. Uh, thank you. Um, this project is massive in scale. Uh, with that, you know, has there been any conversations with the MTA and DOT about increasing bus and train service to this community if this project is to get built? What discussions have you had or is there anything you can you know, uh, tell us about what, uh, what plans are in place? Uh, as you could, as you no doubt saw in the DEIS that was certified on the project, we actually do not have uh, a, tra a transportation impact. Uh, that's that said, we will of course continue to talk to MTA, but certainly regarding surface transit uh, potential to expand. As you know, Commissioner, yeah. MTA often will expand once they show this demand. Uh, with regard to the subway, uh, we do not show under the standard secret analysis that we are showing an impact. Yeah, I saw that. I know the area very well. I, I go there often, and uh, I can tell you, I've been many years at the movie theater, PC Richard, Panera across the street out there, so I'm very familiar, and I know parking is tough, but I also know, you know, taking the train there is the best way, so I'm just curious if they were going to increase service. So uh, thank you for your responses to the questions I had earlier. Thank you. Thank, you for, thank you for visiting our site. And, and, and quite frankly, uh, Commissioner Rampershad, uh, you raise an important point about this project that maybe we haven't emphasized enough. I mean, this is true transit-oriented development. This is what the best urban planning says, where you should uh, build housing, where, should, where a project like this is best suited. And we're uh, sitting between three subway stations, uh, multiple bus lanes, 
uh, bike infrastructure. Uh, obviously, if someone wants to use a car, there's Northern Boulevard, uh, but this is really at the epicenter of where uh, good urban planning would say a project like this should be located. Hi there, this is Lynn Doe from AKRF. I just wanted to clarify that, um, Commissioner, in the DEIS, we did show some uh, transportation impacts. That was uh, traffic as well as pedestrians and transit. Uh, we had identified uh, potential mitigation, and in some cases, there may have been some unmitigated. Uh, as part of the work between draft and final, we are continuing to work with DOT and city planning on uh, addressing some of those impacts. And in the FEIS, we believe that we will identify some additional uh, mitigation that will uh, fully mitigate the uh, impacts that we've looked at. Thank you for the response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, let's see if there are any more questions of the applicant team here before we go to members of the public. <clears throat> Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you all for, uh, for your presence here today uh, and for, uh, uh, for answering uh, these questions. We'll look forward to following up uh, with you as this uh, process continues. Uh, and uh, we are going to go now uh, to um, the public and call on them in turn. Uh, we tend to go uh, in order of uh, five against, five in favor, five against, five in favor to the extent that they exist in that sort of an order. Uh, since we've heard from the applicant team, we're going to go to our uh, first grouping of uh, people who are not supportive of the proposal. And first up is Nancy Silverman to be followed by Isadora Zanon. So uh, Ms. Silverman, as soon as you are ready, you can go ahead and proceed. You have three minutes. Sorry, were you calling on me? If you are Nancy Silverman, then yes. The, is, uh, yes. Go apologies, ahead. Apologies, I was connecting. No, that's okay. No problem. We'll start. As soon as you start, we'll start. We're good. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you, all the commissioners, for your questions of the um, developers. Um, I have been a participant in this, in this um, process for a couple of years. Um, in the sense of a community member who lives nearby. Um, I have testified at various public hearings and so on. And my concerns about this project are, um, are a number of concerns, some of which you raised. Um, the affordability, um, I thank the borough president for bringing up that most strongly and for the community board for disapproving the project, mostly based on affordability. I also wanna talk about um, some of the issues with the, the developers and the way that they are answering your questions. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that they are answering your questions vaguely. And they are doing that, they have been doing that for the two years that they have been asked these questions. So when they say, we'll try to do that, or we expect to do that, I know that the, you commissioners don't need me to tell you that those are not answers. And that the, this is what the borough president also realized when he asked about affordability and waited for them to come back with a number or an answer and said, we will try. I also want to address the last issue of um, uh, public transportation and impact. Now, the, I, I don't doubt that their impact study showed what it showed. But I live a half a block away, and I know that pre-COVID, should we get there, um, my subway stop was back, was packed every morning and every night at, during during rush hour. I work a nine to five job in Midtown, like many of my neighbors, and that I, it's hard to believe that 2,700 apartments will not have an impact on the nearest subway station. Um, their impact study shows there's going to be impact on a station that's 10 blocks away. I don't really understand how that they came to that, but that is what it is. But I just mostly want to talk about the lack of specificity of the developers when they answer the questions. We cannot trust them to, to give us what they ask, especially things that will not be required. And so thank you, commissioners, for your questions and for listening to their answers carefully. I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much, Ms. Silverman. Um, I, I will note for uh, the commission and for new commissioners, 
uh, the way that uh, I tend to um, proceed in the uh, public hearing portion of our meeting is if I see any hands when a member of the public is uh, uh, concluded, I will call on you. If I don't, I'm just gonna move on to the next person. So I'm not just gonna specifically call for questions, but if you do have one, please do raise your hand uh, before they're done and I will call on you. So thank you, Ms. Silverman. Uh, I do not see questions for you from our uh, panel of commissioners, but we appreciate your being here today. Uh, next up is Isadora Zanon, followed by Doreen Mohammed. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Amazing. Hi, so um, my name is Isadora, um, and I agree with Nancy um, in that I have a lot of reservations and concerns about this project. Um, I've only heard about it in the last uh, few months. And um, to be clear, I didn't hear it from Innovation Queens or from any of the um, uh, the the planners, um, the developers of the site. Um, I heard it through my own interest in Astoria and um, the changes that I've been seeing as a longtime resident of this neighborhood. Um, so to be clear, um, so some of my issues are the public space in the project, um, which is not really a public space. Uh, I think it's disingenuous to call it public space. They, they talk about it a lot and they say it as a big positive um, point of their project, um, but it's going to be enclosed in, you know, their 20 something story buildings. Um, it's going to be commercial corridors. Um, it's not going to be a space that's inviting to the neighborhood and they haven't really made any um, changes into the plans uh, that show me uh, or anyone else that, you know, this is a public space. Um, furthermore, it's at the expense of open sky, which is one of the best things about Astoria is that we have a lot of access to the open sky. We don't have a lot of shadows in the neighborhood. Speaking of shadows, their buildings are actually going to cast a huge shadow on Playground 35, which is currently um, where a lot of the kids in the neighborhood play and even their own assessment that playground is going to be continuously in shadow all day, every day throughout the entire year. Um, but really my main concern is uh, the affordability of the housing they offer. I think it, that for a project that's funded by billionaires, it's an absolutely appalling that they only offer a minimum 25 affordable housing 25% of the um, units as affordable housing, which is, you know, legally mandated. They, in fact, they must do it, um, which is to say, I really don't think it's, if it were not a legal requirement that they would, um, that they would have any affordable housing at all. Um, and they haven't made any significant changes to their proposal. I've been out talking about this for the last few months at every town hall, every public meeting there's been, and they just really have not made any changes at all. There's still only 25% affordable housing um, at, you know, and they are very vague, like Nancy said, about the numbers uh, that they're willing to give in terms of any more affordable housing or 30% AMI versus any other percentages of an AMI. And I am actually really appalled that they said they're only going to offer more affordable housing if they get finance from HPD. It's extremely disingenuous that, that they say that they won't make any money off indefinite rent from almost 3,000 units if they can't Fine. get financing. Great. Th thank you very much. Uh, next up is uh, Doreen Mohammed, followed by Evie Hansopoulos. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm a fellow member of the Queens Community Board One. Uh, I'm a first generation working class American. Uh, my parents are from Baldish. Uh, we have voted against this project for a reason. It is not meeting the needs of our community. You know, like they have had back and forth with the land use committee like about 12 times, failed to really meet any of the stipulated recommendations in a meaningful way. What our district needs is the CB1 is 45% very low income to low income. We need deeply affordable housing that's at 30% AMIs and less. 47% of CB1 is rent burden. And these are likely conservative numbers. There is no good faith action from them to engage in the community board's recommendations, in President Donovan Richards' um, recommendations. And we just keep seeing this like 
the strain is going to give on our subways like you know like that area as nancy and isadora alluded to like we need to invest in the infrastructure like the sewage infrastructure you name it like we can't even afford that influx of residents and it won't even meet the needs of our community it's mostly going to yield displacement as well as secondary and third tertiary level displacement you know like my two bedroom here is two thousand dollars their two bedrooms would be five thousand dollars like i have been working in city government and public service and i'm on this community board and i can't even afford their housing right and then this is also threatening to displace many of the you know black and brown immigrant working class elderly folks in the area you know we have sikov and the Bangladeshi attendants which you know i represent and engage with, like they can't afford this. This doesn't meet their needs and we deserve a lot better. There's been no good faith interactions. Like there's been no good faith community interactions. They were giving out bagels at NYCHA to people who are food insecure and forcing them to sign support cards to act like this would actually be good for the community. Like as Nancy alluded, they keep giving vague answers. They don't engage properly and they're not they're not meeting the needs of this community. This project is an abomination. It's going to drive out the working class businesses on Steinway Street. Desi Barbecue's rent keeps spiking because of it. And there's so many others like we already have supermarkets in the area bringing, like, you know, these expensive, unaffordable things will not help. There's no good safe interaction. They have not even addressed that they didn't meet the council member Julie Wan's recommendations for her land use practices as well as when she was engaging with them before she wrote a whole op-ed about this. So there's a lot going on and I'm happy to stay on to answer more questions, have more of a conversation. Great, thank you. There are some questions for you. I'm gonna start with Commissioner Goodrich. Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, so my, I want to give you the opportunity to address um, what will very likely be responses to this project, um, because I, I think it's important to hear from your perspective. Um, and the first and main argument with projects like these are, this will address a housing shortage, even if, it, even if the apartments aren't affordable and that somehow by providing um, many market rate or unafford, you know, apartments that are unaffordable to the large number of people who live in the community, it will prevent displacement because then higher income people won't take up um, the apartments that are affordable. Can you respond to that? Because that tends to be the main argument with these types of projects. Can you respond to that? Sure. So, I mean, there's been plenty of data and stuff that's shown that that's not the case. You know, New York City developed a, a, a NYC equitable development tool, which is where the data I cited earlier about the needs of the community is coming from. This, we know this area is at a intermediate to high risk of displacement. So, like, it does have an impact. And this is just, it's just YIMBY real estate interest propaganda saying that if we build more housing, it'll meet the need. New York City actually has a pretty high vacancy rate. Um, there are folks that, who have been talking about how it's like 12.5%, if not higher. And I said this in my testimony to the Queens um, Borough President, as well as at the community board, there are rent stabilized units being held hostage uh, as well. So like the issue isn't that we don't have enough housing is that it's being that the few like the housing we have a lot of it that's being built is for the higher end of the market that doesn't mean it mean of me needs of new yorkers most new yorkers like at least 50 percent of new yorkers or more earn under fifty thousand a year like that's the housing group we need to be building for and we need to address by building deeply affordable housing 30 percent amis or less otherwise if we don't need to rubber stamp these projects that will displace folks like we already have like so many luxury units in LIC and other places that remain vacant. And it's also profitable for many of these big real estate landlords to keep them vacant because they can write off the losses and we don't have any vacancy taxes or any type of liability for that. So there's a lot of bigger systemic issues and it's really bad faith um, to be like, oh, if we just build, 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 that's gonna solve the problem. Like, no, if you're not building the right kind of housing, deeply affordable housing, investing in public housing and NYCHA, community land trust models, like th th these luxury apartments are not it. Okay, and thank you, that was very helpful. Um, my second and last question is um, for this type of, well, uh, well, you know, my position is really for all projects, there should be a racial equity statement, but for this type of project, um, there wasn't required, but developers submitted one anyway, and you mentioned uh, the, dis the what this project would 
how this project would impact black and brown people in the community. Can you speak from your perspective? Um, essentially, my question is what would be your racial equity statement and how this project would impact black and brown people in the community? Sure, uh, we know there's issues with the racial impact study that they produced. Um, Evi Hamzapos, who's after me, who's the chair of the housing committee, she'll likely be able to speak more on that in detail. But for me, like, you know, as a first generation American, my parents are, you know, like from Bangladesh, there's so many Bangladeshi immigrants here, elderly folks, Latinx folks, we can't afford this. Like I am college educated, like I, like I went to Columbia and like, I cannot afford these apartments on this community board, you know, like it is direct gas line to me and so many folks that make Astoria and Queens great, you know, like we see folks who are coming from, you know, Texas into New York City as a haven. And like, we need that kind of deeply affordable housing, you know, like the fact that Desi BBQ's business, this is a, a bond issue owner, their rent used to be, I think, 600 a month. And it's not even with this project being passed, just a speculation, the speculative real estate that this project might come, their rent has soared to 4,000 a month. And they don't think they're gonna be able to last long enough. There are other businesses on Steinway Street that is dealing with similar issues. Like I think Steinway Billiards, like there's a bunch. And you know, these folks have not been engaged in a meaningful way. Like, you know, when they, this project first came out, and it's been going on, you know, for years, at least two years, if not more, like there was no Bangla engagement for the Bangladeshi community. They, we had to fight to get any type of translation on the website. And then that translation was wrong. But it's the thing is that we're not white privileged folks or gentrifiers that can act as settler colonialists. And that's why they don't care about it. It's like, oh, we don't have the money. We can't pay 5,000 a month, uh, you know, for two bedroom. So like, we're not who they're trying to target. If people really understand how this works, they wouldn't work well. Like they pay people to come disrupt our rally uh, and press conference outside of the, the Queens Community Board one meeting that we had. I think they were giving for like 25 bucks. But when we explained to folks like, hey, you can't, can you afford this apartment? Like, can you afford a $5,000 two bedroom? Like the union workers, they're not even guaranteeing, guaranteeing that this is gonna be a union thing. There's no accountability, all these community benefits, et cetera. Like it's all just talk, but then the people you're gonna exploit to build this cannot even afford to live in this. And like we see how race and class are linked in this country and in this city where it's even more stronger, black and brown us New Yorkers are the poorest, are the highest risk of displacement, continue, are the highest risk of homelessness, and we continue to be disenfranchised. And I keep trying to engage in these conversations, do various hearings from, by Innovation Queens, the community of board, Queens board president. You know, like even the format of this hearing isn't the most accessible to most black and brown New Yorkers based on the time and day and the format and the lack of like, we don't know what time you get to speak and how it works. So, you know, I hope that was all clear and I will be submitting a written testimony Very in clear. detail, but yeah. Thank but you so much. Have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Goodrich, Commissioner Osorio. Thank you so much for your testimony to you and to the previous speakers. I had two really quick questions just to uh, mainly for clarification. So number one, the applicant and the team just uh, explained a series of adjustments and uh, specific work that has been invested on improving the quality of the open spaces to respond to the community needs. Has this been communicated to the community board? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it has not. But let's also just clarify that area already has public open space. This is already spoke about that, that there's a public playground. and you know, bulldozing through like putting these long, unaffordable, non-eco-friendly tall buildings, which that area infrastructure can't even handle. Like we would need at least two subways additional during rush hour to do this. The MTA said they could only maybe do one. You know, like there's no, we, don't, we haven't even addressed like the sewage concerns and like the strain that were put on that area. So like th th this public open space is a misrepresentation, a bad faith thing, like it's not true. And it's definitely not meeting the needs of the community. Like it is deplorable that they keep touting that building tall luxury high rises like is the key to like open space and revitalizing a disenfranchised community. They like to paint this area as like a wasteland. Like I've heard of some things where they say, oh, like, oh, like no one really lives in this part in the story in general, whatever. And it's like, it's like it's it's honestly rooted in racism and like xenophobia towards like the working class immigrant businesses and people that live there, as well as the many rent stabilized units, which have mostly elderly and disabled folks living there as well. 
Thank you, Ms. Mohammed. Uh, I had another very quick question, which is in the during the dialogue with the applicant, um, the applicant expressed interest in implementing some of the recommendations from the Queensboro presidents, particularly the creation of the small business grant fund and the community development fund. Has this interest been communicated to the community board? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, like, I have not heard anything, but you know, like even Don Richards himself hasn't heard anything, you know, like he even noted that when he put his thing, like we have been calling for a hundred percent deeply affordable housing at 30% AMIs or less to even consider this project, you know, and like they can't even come properly the way 145 did when it was going through the similar process with like the 50% that Don has been proposed, which I still think is deeply insufficient. Right, like we are in a housing crisis. Like rents have soared in New York City by thirty-three percent in county. For some people, fifty percent. I don't even know how I and I grew up in Queens. You know, I don't even know how I'm going to afford to live here and continue to serve on this community board and do public service work in a couple of months if I'm in a market rate apartment. Like these issues are really real, and this lack of bad faith, these vague answers, when there's also no accountability if they get this rezoning, as Nancy Silverman and other folks have spoken on, I'm sure Evie will speak more on this. It, it, it's deeply alarming. And this product just needs to really be killed and just not be dignified. Like we need to see it for the bad faith, gentrifying settler colonials project that it is at the expense of working class, black and brown and other New Yorkers, all working class New Yorkers. Thank you for your response. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Muhammad. We appreciate uh, very much your being here with us uh, today. Uh, let me go on to uh, Evie Hansopoulos to be followed by Christina Chase. Evie is not in the room. Okay, let's move on to uh, Christina Chase. Hi, good morning. Good well, morning. afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm Christina Good Chase. afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm here today as vice president of the Ravenswood Resident Association, a member of the Justice for All Coalition, and a longtime resident of Western Queens. Um, living here in public housing, I've watched how rezoning and private development has fostered more segregation, isolation within and across Western Queens, positioning certain areas as inaccessible for our enjoyment. Um, the blocks I've traversed all my life have become unfamiliar and almost unwelcoming, occupied by high-rise buildings, new restaurants, and boutiques, most of which I cannot afford and access. I'm here today because affordable housing initiatives utilizing MIH at 25%, AMI at 40% or more, are not inclusive of extremely low-income families and disregards many poor and working-class residents who do not meet the income requirements. The median income of NYCHA residents is below 30,000. We and many like us will not be able to access this space at both residential and commercial levels. This is an issue of economic, racial, and disability justice. If approved, this will disrupt, displace, and just, excuse me, this will disrupt, disturb, and displace many of us in the long term. Moreover, as an educator, I know this will exacerbate the resources and capacity of local public schools, which are already struggling at present. With inflation and homelessness at an all-time high, this is the last thing we need. I was born and raised in Queens, and now I'm four months pregnant and worried that I may not be able to raise my child in the very neighborhood that raised me. Sorry, excuse me. Um, I cannot fathom how many other families have been destabilized and displaced by plans like this. All of our kids have a right, excuse me, all of our kids have a right to a stable and vibrant future in a story and not just those whose parents are income eligible. It's quite clear that Innovation Queens will change the culture of our neighborhood and create further barriers for addressing structural inequities that hamper our quality of life and sense of dignity as working class people. I implore you to vote no on Innovation Queens. Thank you kindly and I'll be here if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, with us. We, ap we appreciate your, your being here. Um, and uh, I know that this is a, this is a difficult uh, conversation clearly. And, uh, but we, we do appreciate your, your being here and sharing your perspective. So thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, let me move on to the next person who has signed up to testify. 
That is Nakia George to be followed by John Miller. Nakia George is not in the room, uh, neither is John Miller. Okay, how about David Sukup? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, I'm here, you? Uh, and yeah, can you hear me? We can, go right ahead. Thank you. Well, I am um, want to express my full support for the um, Innovation Queens project. Uh, as a local resident, I wanna see my community to become a, a vibrant place to live, work, and raise families. Additionally, I, I'm a senior citizen. I wanna be able to remain in my community. The Innovation Queens project will allow just that. Many of my neighbors, including myself, live in walk-up apartments that will soon no longer be accessible to us. The community needs more affordable housing for seniors to ensure that, uh, that, uh, that me and other Astoria residents can age in place in a community that we, know and love. Right now, older New Yorkers like myself are waiting five years for affordable senior housing on average. The Innovation Queens project will provide new, accessible, and most importantly, affordable senior housing that we greatly need in this community. The project also offers many other community benefits, 5,400 jobs, over two acres of open space, new space for local nonprofits to expand their services. This community needs to be revitalized and developed to grow and progress. This project will support Astoria families, Astoria seniors, and Astoria local businesses. I urge you to support the Innovation Queens project. Great, thank you, thank, thank you very much uh, for your uh, testimony. And we, uh, we appreciate uh, your, your being here. Uh, we're gonna go next uh, to Laura Piccolo. I understand that uh, Addis Kolonovich and David Kilmanik are not in the room. Uh, so I will go to Laura Piccolo, if I have this correct. Um, Ms. Piccolo, you are next up. Hi there, um, good afternoon, I am a- Thank you. I'm a longtime Astoria resident, and I'm just here to reiterate some points that have already been said. Um, when 75% of the housing proposed is completely unaffordable, student, studios starting at $3,100, <laughs> why would this project even be considered by any government entity? $3,100 for a studio apartment. Make 75% unaffordable housing in a massive block long development makes sense to this community. This project has already been rejected by the community board and by the borough president. And there is a reason why. The bottom line is this development is, but is not beneficial for the people of Astoria. We are a working class neighborhood and we need working class prices for housing and commerce. This project will have catastrophic effects for decades to come. You will most likely hear from people uh, who do not live in Astoria, lauding the benefits of creating hundreds of units that cost three and four and $5,000 a month in rent. They are unaware or not caring at how negatively this will impact our community. Rents in the surrounding areas will rise to compete with this development and piggyback off of their infrastructure, further exasperating our housing crisis. We 100% need housing. I think everyone is in agreement. There is an issue, there is a crisis. We need development, we need park space, we need space for nonprofits. But today we're demanding better than what this development is offering. Bells and whistles are really nice, uh, but this affordable, unaffordable housing project development is not it. We have the power today to create a better future for Queens. We do not need a market saturated with 75% unaffordable housing. Projects like these create the housing crisis. So I'm asking everyone today to vote for Queens and against luxury housing that does not meet the needs of anyone who lives in the community today. So thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you. Uh, next up will be Anandita Sarkar Onadi from CAV. Anandita is not in the room. 
Okay. Uh, moving on to Joaquim Rabinovich. Um, hello, can anybody hear me? We can. We, we okay. certainly can. Bye. Welcome. Bye. Thank you. Um, my name is Joachim Rabinovich. I am a longtime story resident for 22 years. I immigrated from Paris, France when I was 13 years old, and I moved to Astoria, and I've stayed a resident to Astoria ever since. Um, I am opposed to this innovation, Queen's development and rezoning. Um, and I come from a different place. Um, we've all heard about the transportation, sanitation, um, affordable housing burden, but I'd like to take a different uh, style of approach and speak to the city planning commission. Uh, being a Paris resident and for 13 years when I was a kid, anyone that's visited Paris, uh, one of the most visited cities in the world has walked and seen the beauty of the buildings, um, the limestone buildings, the facades that have been kept um, the same. And that is because the city planning of Paris commissions and all the city planning agencies have made a concerted effort to keep the height of Paris buildings and the look of Paris buildings a certain way. And if anyone has ever lived or been to Astoria, you've seen maybe five to four story buildings, and but not 24 stories, not 17 stories, not 25, 20, nothing like that. And to me, it would be a great displeasure and uh, just a visual burden. I know may, may, many people may not care about, but I'm just, again, coming from a different kind of perspective, just to another reason why to vote no. And, you know, if you walk around Paris, you see this, you, you don't see glass tower monstrosities that are around. And I, this is kind of a personal reason for me why I vote against is I will urge the development team to rethink their approach to how to build in this, in a neighborhood that doesn't have glass tower buildings, at least in that area of Eastern Astoria kind of Woodside. Um, so just think about what do you want the city to look like in the future? Do you want to keep the beauty of the city, the old buildings, the brick buildings, or do you want to put more glass towers buildings? Because you, if the city planning commission and any other governmental agencies uh, approve this, uh, you are opening the floodgates. Then you would see that happening in other neighborhood, Sunnyside, Woodside, and what's next. So this is not just an approach just for this particular uh, zoning, but it's kind of think towards the future. What do we want our city to look like in 20, 30, 45 years. Um, and this is why I'm vehemently against it. And I will urge the development team to really rethink their approach and think about what you're doing to not just the affordable housing market, but also visually to the neighborhood. And uh, that's it, I email time. Thank you very much. Let me go to Commissioner Goodrich. Oh, maybe. Commissioner, did you have a question or comment? Uh, I, I have a shock, Mike. Okay. Um, sorry. Well, okay. okay. All right. Sorry. All right. Let me just ask one quick. Sorry. <laughs> um, quickly, I guess um, my question is what would you say? Because this obviously would be the pushback um, about new, because this is the, the main, one of the main um, pros, I guess, that the developers have been mentioning is the green building, all the facilities and all the technology. And I am betting that their response would be something along the lines of, you know, it, it's, a, it's a sacrifice of you can't have the older buildings with the older architecture that they have to be this new developed building and, and it brings other pros. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I like and I see what you're saying about neighborhood character. I guess I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to what obviously would be their counter response. Absolutely. And uh, I'm not an architect. Uh, I am a city worker, I work for DOT, so I am pro-union, a member of DC 37, uh, proudly. Um, but I guess I would say you would look at what other older European cities have done. Um, they have been new construction here. I've walked I've in the story that have kind of kept the neighborhood character. My, I guess my, my main pushback would be the height of the buildings. 
Um, I understand density and uh, financial viability and profit margins. The more you build, the higher you build, the more uh, you have profit off of it. But I would, I would kind of think of their holistic approach to kind of looking at how the neighborhood character looks like currently and keeping the height of the buildings to a minimum. There's no need to go, go big or go home. There's a need to kind of integrate with the neighborhood and what the neighborhood looks like and what the neighborhood needs. Um, so that, that would be my, my response to that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rabinovich. Uh, we appreciate your testimony and uh, we're gonna move on. Um, I understand that um, Tehuda Amin, Maria Fatore and Corrine Haynes, uh, who have all signed up are not in the room. So um, if that is correct, which I believe it is, I'm going to move on to George Stamatiadis. Mr. Stamatiadis. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, we got thank you. you very, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I just wanted to tell you that I'm in totally in favor of the Queen's Innovation Project, and I'd like to present a grassroots residents' view of it. The entire community has fought major battles to create the atmosphere that attracted this great project. The Dutch Guilds community fought for to change the zoning from M1 to mixed use, which ended devastation conditions on existing residential homes, which were deemed non-conforming use, which made it difficult to get mortgages, insurance, and the ability to rebuild our homes if they were damaged more than 50%. And of course, no new housing as of right. The major battles fought by generations to make this community the great that it, place that it is, is the fight to stop the state from taking over Rikers Island, anti-graffiti programs and parades that we did. Street prostitution was cleaned up and agreements with the Port Authority at LaGuardia for sound abatement and traffic conditions and late night flights considerations. All these efforts produce this great community. Innovation Queens will continue the growth and success of our community by removing a five block blighted area of junk cars, garbage and crime. This project will bring new, much needed new facilities, new business opportunities, new much needed employment and a great quality of life. There's one other thing that I wanna bring up. I'm annoyed that anybody after being president of the Boys and Girls Club in Queens would tell me that the kids that came to that facility could not afford apartments in that building. There's plenty of them out there that can. Shame on you for running this through race. It's disgusting. That's all I know. And the other thing is this project is gonna bring housing. It's certainly gonna bring more jobs and it's gonna give great opportunity to minority groups to open business. Shame on you. Anybody that throws the race card into a great project like this should be ashamed of themselves. I'm sorry, I'm Mediterranean. You cooked me up and now that I'm cooked, I'm giving you the meat. That's all I can tell you. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. You do have a question from Commissioner Goodrich. Commissioner, go ahead. I do. Uh, you gave us the appetizer. Now it's ready for the entree. Um, I, I do have some pushback, actually. Um, uh, I, you know, there have been some very valid points about racialized displacement. Uh, uh, the studios that are $3,000 are clearly extremely unaffordable, even for moderate income not even including lower income. And when you add in race in, in addition to income, that is racialized displacement. And yes, um, you know, perhaps some businesses of color may benefit, but that's a separate issue. Um, but you know, we're, we're, you know, you brought up some points about displacement and there have been some very valid points about that. I, I, you know, I didn't hear anything other than just an assertion you know, I didn't hear any statistics or anything, but you know, I, I'm not a I'm not a statistic person. I'm a real life person, and I'm telling you that are, there were kids at the Boys and Girls Club that are, were of a, all colors. Okay, that went on to become successful and to be able to probably afford that or afford it. And I think it's it's it just takes the wind out of kids that want to work hard 
and get where they want to get. And now you're telling them, hey, we're building this, but you can't afford this. Do you know if it wasn't if it wasn't for Kaufman, the studios wouldn't have been built and the hundreds of jobs that it generates and the millions of dollars that it generates for the city and the commercial strip that it built. You want to stop progress? Then we're just going to go backwards. You're going to progressively go backwards like a steam engine at 100 miles an hour. And my kids, I, 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 my kids succeeded. They did not fall back. They did not go to jail. Yeah. My, my comment to you is you aren't recognizing systemic racism and discrimination. And it exists. And this is what people here have come to testify about. So okay. I, I, I clearly disagree. Clearly no, disagree. One said, no one said, um, Commissioner, do re, with all due respects, I did not say that it may or may not exist. But to use it as a weapon is wrong. You're basically saying that anyone bringing up that keep that their racialized displacement is playing the race card, and that in well, itself well, is, then is then racist. Then so we, like, we can go back okay, and forth. Hold, 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 hold on, me, hold on, hold on, hold on, everybody, Commissioner, Commissioner, sir, hold on, everybody, just hold for one second. I am just gonna just take a moment. Because I I, every, no, no, I commissioner, I want to give you commissioner. Right I want to give you a chance. I want to give you a chance to speak because I felt like the the te the person the, the gentleman yeah. testifying, Mr. Stamiatis, was perhaps speaking over you. So I just want to give you a chance, and then if he wants to respond, he'll respond. But I just want to make sure that everybody has a chance to be heard. Uh, so go ahead, commissioner. Or is yours? I just want to make clear because I don't want there to be any um, misconception about this project, and I also don't want you know, people to weaponize this and say that somehow this is turning against people of color who are moderate income and so forth, because that, that has been weaponized, especially with small landlords in housing. So I want to make clear that it is a real true fact that there are a lot of people of color in the city who cannot um, who, who are moderate income, who are lower income, who cannot afford these luxury apartments. And this is a perfect example of it. Um, this particular community is extremely racially diverse. Um, you mentioned that someone didn't go to jail. Um, that you don't know, I mean, that again, we're talking about systemic racism. We're talking about, and, and that is not being recognized here. Um, I don't think that it's fair to you know, all of the comments about shame on so-and-so, I, I, I don't think that those comments are for, like, I can go on and on, but I just want to rebuke your comments and say that I don't, I don't agree um, at all whatsoever as one of the commissioners on here. Um, and I don't think that that is really a fair way to even frame this project. And in fact, I think many of your comments are quite frankly racist. So that's my comment for the day. Well, it's not my comment for the day, but it's my comment for, for, for this exchange. Um, okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, let me uh, let us move on to. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Are you still Are you still there, sir? Yes, I just wanted. Okay. To go ahead. You can go, you, you can you can respond, and then I'm going to call it a day, and we're going to move on to our next person. Yes. Go ahead. Again, uh, Commissioner Goodrich, I can imagine that there are many people that are not of any color, or all colors, that can't afford to come into this situation. So just as there are all kinds of people that can't afford to go into it, at least they have an opportunity to go into it. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for your, your testimony. Let's move on to uh, Carl Goodman uh, to be followed by Osagi Afe. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Carl Goodman. I'm the executive director of the Museum of the Moving Image in the a, in a story of Queens. I hope this can serve as a bit of a palate cleanser between the appetizer and the entree. I am speaking in support of Innovation Queens with respect to the benefits it provides to the Museum of the Moving Image and its existence as a cultural anchor of the neighborhood and to the diverse audiences that it serves throughout NYC. We're a $7 million nonprofit org. With the help of city council in 2011, we completed a $67.5 million dollar major expansion that allowed us to double our capacity to public school audiences. And it's also prepared us for this moment. Our corner borders a middle school, the movie studio, and a Starbucks. On a catty corner, this is where the development would be. Our most prominent visual marker is the largest parking lot I've ever seen for a sole big box electronic store and a woefully technically inadequate 
multiplex, which is a part of this will be demolished and built with the latest amenities. We've been here for 35 years. You may not know this, but we've been partners with our neighbors at KAS for the entire time. They were once our landlord in the subways for the city. We have not always been on the same side. We have not always seen eye to eye. But in this case, I have to say that we are aligned. Part one, we ain't going nowhere. We're owned by the city. And uh, we will continue to serve as a cultural anchor in a neighborhood art house movie theater. Point number two, we get a new space in the development. Um, and we are holding Kaufman to that promise. And they have not gone back on one since we started working together. Hardest part is to get them to make them make the promise, but we will be expanding in the way that it has been uh, described before, and our activities will be largely community-based as well as uh, generating an income that allowed us, allows us to present our community programs. Point three, we will serve more people. We have 200,000 visitors a year right now in the neighborhood. If you haven't visited, shame on you, but we uh, expect a 25% rise in visitors. Um, 60,000 of them are New York City school students. Uh, we are at capacity with school visits and need to expand that. Um, point four, we got a revitalized street in front of our front entrance. 35th Avenue, actually, compared to Steinway, is a, is, is a bit desolate and dark, and in some cases, even unhealthy. Um, the project will enliven this corridor where our front entrance exists. We see foot traffic as increasingly increasing markedly, which benefits, of course, the museum as a place to drop into um, and learn and, um, and have an elevated experience the museum can provide. Um, it will open up the corridor on Steinway Street so that our board chair doesn't get lost on its way to the museum after getting out of the subway car. Um, finally, I have read the environmental impact study related to this project. There are modest changes that I would like to see, but none that can't be accomplished through the process Time. of negotiation uh, and continued work. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mr. Goodman. And uh, we will encourage everyone to come pay you a visit. Um, uh, and uh, we, we appreciate <laughs> that point and all of them. So thank you, thanks for being here. Um, let me go on to Asagi Afe to be followed by Melva Miller. Nice, nice. I'll, I'll close. Osagi, sir. <laughs> um, uh, I'm actually here to, uh, to represent my colleague who couldn't be with us today. Uh, so this, this is his testimony on his behalf. So um, Charles Yu, Senior Director of Business Assistance at the Long Island City um, uh, Partnership, uh, is here to support the innovation of QNS project which we think will benefit uh, the community. The Long Island City Partnership advocates for economic development that benefits the industrial, commercial, tech, cultural, tourism, and residential sectors of Long Island City. Our mission is to attract new businesses to LIC, retain those already here, welcome new residents and visitors, and promote a vibrant, authentic misuse community. We manage the LIC Business Improvement District, LIC bid, our neighborhood has emerged as a vibrant mixed use community, which has proven to be an important attribute that enables us to better withstand and recover from the pandemic compared to other areas. The proposed development will reinforce and add to this strength by delivering several much needed benefits that the community at large has been requesting for a long time. People are moving to this great neighborhood as the latest census has shown, but space is becoming limited. In response to this, the project will create more than 725 permanent affordable housing and senior apartment units on city blocks that could be utilized. More than two acres of public open space with greeneries, playground, performances space, and a dark park for the community, and 60,000 square footage of community hub for organizations with deep local roots to expand much needed services. In addition, the project will create many jobs and career paths during the construction and permanent and permanency for local job seekers, existing small businesses, many of which are part of the dynamic fabric of this neighborhood will benefit too when new residents and visitors spend locally. 
if this project does not move forward, it will be a real missed opportunity to expand access to affordable housing, create more public open space and community space, hire local job seekers who are ready, willing, and able to work in their community. Uh, thank you, folks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Great. Thank, thank you very much for being here. Um, uh, we have a uh, question for you from Commissioner Osorio. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. And this may be a question really for the author of the testimony, but I'm wondering if you can provide any insight in this, I'll try my uh, regarding best. this question. Thank yes, you. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, my understanding is that the Long Island City Partnership operates the Long Island City Industrial Business Zone. Yep. And I want to understand, besides the benefits that you pointed out, uh, what are the benefits to industrial jobs of the project, of the proposed project? Uh, there's a potential to bring uh, more construction jobs um, for to build out and, and, and uh, increase more jobs uh, for our businesses. Uh, so, so that's, that's the benefit, um, more jobs. Has the applicant expressed any additional interest in supporting other sectors in the community, other industrial sectors in the community? Yes. Can you expand a little bit on that? Uh, I'll, I think this is a more question the author uh, would be. Understood, understood. Mind. Thank you so much for your insight. Definitely. And there is an opportunity to the extent that you want to supplement uh, this in, in response to Commissioner Basario's questions. Absolutely. Opportunity after the hearing and you should certainly feel free to, uh, to do that. Gotcha. Uh, thank you very much. We, we appreciate it. Um, let me go on to Melva Miller to be followed by Bilkis Begum. Good morning, can you hear me? Good afternoon, sorry. We can hear you, yes, I'm getting confused too. Half the people are saying good morning and I'm saying good morning back. Half the, other, half the people are saying good afternoon, I'm saying good afternoon. I don't know what time of day it is, but it is good to see you, welcome. Great to see you, thank you, Chair. And thank you, rest of the commissioners. Uh, my name is Melba Miller and I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Association for a Better New York, affectionately known as ABNY and a Queens resident. Uh, who worked in this area for a very long time. Uh, ABNY is a nonprofit organization representing many, many stakeholders. But more importantly, our mission is really to promote uh, the connections between the public sector, the private sectors to make New York City a great place and, and continuously great place for people to live, work and visit for all. Uh, as you know, as New York City strives to recover from the economic fallout of COVID, it is important uh, that our city rebound through job creation, the addition of affordable housing, and contributions to our tax base, right? This is particularly important as policymakers prioritize communities that have historically faced the longstanding systemic challenges of unemployment and housing insecurity while addressing the needs of workers, residents, and businesses stemming from COVID-19. According to the US Census Bureau, the, the New York City continues to grow, right? 630,000 people since 2010, and it continues uh, to grow in population size, while unemployment rates continue to be the highest in the country. It is crucial that New York City and neighborhoods like Astoria find pathways to economic resiliency and inclusive opportunity. At the height of the pandemic, unemployment rates in Astoria were alarmingly high. 30% of its residents were unemployed, many of whom were people of color. A lot of talk about that on the call today. Um, the Queens Innovation Project has the opportunity to address these challenges with this multi-use development project that will, uh, in, uh, sorry, will increase employment exponentially with 5,400 um, job, 5, jobs, 10 times the number of jobs currently in the five block area, creating well-paying middle-class working class union jobs with family sustaining wages. That's very key. Additionally, the project will produce much needed affordable housing. Um, and we know that the developers are working uh, with the community to increase this with more than 700 currently with more on the rise with a wide range of affordab affordability levels addressing housing instability concerns that have impacted New Yorkers and many area residents for decades. 
Uh, furthermore, uh, there was a lot talked about the quality of life enhancements with the uh, two acres of new publicly accessible open space planned for the area. But lastly, the development will support local businesses that are vitally important to the economic sustainability of the neighborhood. Many businesses were negatively impacted by the pandemic, particularly small minority women-owned businesses. And this development project has promised to generate additional support for Astoria businesses with a projected 50 million in new spending. We spoke about that. So as a story- Time. We questions from Ms. Miller? Commissioner Borzak? Hi there, thanks for your um, testimony. Um, I'm just curious to hear a little bit about um, kind of your position and Abney's position in general, if it has one on, you know, we, we've heard some serious concerns and there's, I know Abney takes kind of the citywide view and has to, um, uh, but there there is this real tension between kind of citywide needs and very real local needs and concerns. Um, I think Commissioner Goodrich was, was kind of pulling out some of these um, what I don't necessarily agree with it as false narratives that, you know, um, new housing is, you know, there is a lot of data that kind of new development and new housing in particular um, is good for bringing down rents over time, maybe not right in the neighborhood on site. I think that's the, the very real tension with these projects that is very challenging to deal with. But this, this idea of that, unless this project is 100% affordable, it shouldn't, shouldn't move forward. And it's on private land, which is very challenging to sometimes for the public side to compel private landowners to go fully 100% affordable if they're not willing. But I'm just kind of curious, what is, what is, how does Abney kind of approach this tension of, you know, these kind of citywide issues and concerns that are at play here with very real local concerns and when kind of the right threshold is met for a project meeting, meeting these needs while also having potential impacts at the local level that are really um, can be very distressful. Right. Thank you for that. So, you know, we really believe that um, all, pro all projects are local to someone, right, um, especially to certain communities. And if we want New York City to continue to be the place where people come, people stay and people want to be, it has to continue to grow. Right. It has to we have to create more jobs. We have to create more business opportunities. We have to create more housing. So more housing is better. In terms of affordability, right, we know that there are uh, different levels of income uh, that are being strained by the housing crisis. So whereas we know that, and we know the statistics of the area, and it's been talked about uh, here in terms of people who are of the lower income bands in Astoria, we also heard talk about the middle class and working class, right? So we do know that there are housing needs for uh, the middle class as well. So our position really on housing is we have to continue to build. We have to work with the private sector to do that. And government needs to incentivize the private sector. And we also have to make sure that we are looking at the housing needs of income bases across the spectrum, low, medium, working, medium, high as well. Um, and then it's working with the community, not in spite of the community needs, right? So I think the sort of, um, from Abney's perspective, we pay very close attention to what happens at the community board levels, at the borough president's levels, making sure that those conversations are happening. So when it gets to the city planning commission stage and the city council stage, uh, it is our hope that there are some fruitful conversations that will tailor each project that will be in response to the needs of the community, but also address the needs of the city. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I will call some names of some folks who've already been called and weren't in the room and now are back in back in the room. Uh, the first is Nakia George. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Nikia George and I'm a community advocate for Woodside Queens. And I wanted to start off by saying I'm for, I'm 100% for the project of Innovation Queens. And I wanted to let everybody know that it is a critical time to invest in our city in general and more specifically within the boroughs outside of Manhattan. 
This project alone will create 2,800 units of housing the city desperately needs. 700 plus, which would be permanently affordable homes at a wide range of affordability levels, over two acres of new publicly accessible open space. This development will revitalize the Steinway corridor and to provide much needed spending and excitement around ex existing local businesses who have struggled throughout the pandemic. 3,700 construction jobs, 1,700 permanent jobs, and 10 times the number of jobs currently on the five block area, including good union jobs that pay families sustaining wages. We have so many members who are unable to work in the neighborhood. They live in an ad, and this adds to that. The project will finally make a change for the entire Astoria. This development will also bring in a wide range of community services and amenities, and this includes major community innovation hubs where nonprofit organizations can expend their services in Astoria and grow. Thank you for your time, and thank you for listening. I am in full support of Innovation Queens, and I hope that you all find a way or encourage yourself to be in full support of this project because right now it doesn't seem bright, but it will bring forth a bright future where we will have to accommodate and we will all have to work together. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to John Miller. Yes, hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay, hi. I am. Uh, that's a tough act to follow, but I am also in full 100% support of the uh, of the project. I um, I grew up in Astoria. I work in Astoria. Um, unfortunately, my job had taken me. Um, not my job. My my family had taken me out to New Jersey, where um, you know rents are exploding all over the place. It's it's you know it's not just the New York City area, and it's just become way unaffordable uh, for me to commute and, and live that far away from, from, uh, from where I work. So, um, you know, an opportunity like this uh, to live in a beautiful place that would, uh, uh, believe it or not, be affordable to someone like me that can't afford the rents anymore in Jersey for, for what I need. Um, you know, the other thing I can say is if where the project is being built to me is, um, I remember as a kid, Kauf the Kaufman Studio area, how decrepit it was and what they did for that community um, and the thriving businesses and, and all it's brought in there. Um, I can envision that happening to this five block area, which is completely decrepit and nothing is going on there at the time. Um, and I know the talk has been all about affordable housing and, um, you know, I, I, I can empathize with that, but there are people like myself that aren't rich, but do fall above the affordable housing level. And, um, you know, so there are other people in this in, in this area that would like um, to live in some type of an, uh, an, a beautiful apartment building like this and this area and bring the amount of jobs and uh, money that it will bring, you know, to that area. Um, so basically, that's all I have to say. Uh, I am 100 percent. I don't I, you know, we're starving for affordable housing, yet they're going to say, you know, they want to say no to 725 affordable units. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, so we have Aris Konovich. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? So my name is Aris Konovich. I'm full to the um, I'm going to bring up the topics for the people that are close to the development site, uh, culture, um, how it's going to raise rents, affect rents in the area, and um, let me start with those. Rents are already up in Florida. I've spoken about this before. I'm going to keep it short this time. Rents are already up. There's already on streeties, there's an apartment for rent. Four thousand dollars $500 bedrooms. It's already active. Now, people are saying this is going to raise rent in Astoria. No, rents are up. So with or without this development site, Astoria has a problem for a group of people. Uh, I see it's expensive myself, but it's a very...
Mr. Looks like we lost the speaker. Yeah, it looks like we, we lost Mr. Kalinovich. Um, can you hear us? Um, yes. Uh, am I okay. You're, you're cutting in and out. Um, am I good? Yeah, there you go. I'm good. All right. Uh, so regarding rent, story, it's not going to the story of getting increased rents. No, rents are already up. Astoria West, things called Astoria West on the they have four hundred dollar one bedroom, dollars one bedroom. It's already here. Uh, a lot of people that are coming to Astoria with strong income which are raising the rents. They have no choices but to look at free market walk up. Um, Maybe he can submit his written testimony. Yeah, Mr. Kolnovich, we, we're having trouble hearing you. We can either uh, have you submit, or we could also try to dial you in if you, if you, if we can get you a a, a, a number to dial you in, and then on the phone call. Yep, you're muted. Can you can you come back to me after one person? Yes, yes, we can come back to you. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. And then next we have uh, Onanidita Sarkar Onanadi. Hi. Hi. How's everyone doing today? Good. Um, so earlier, um, I am sorry, I am a community organizer for CAV, uh, Asians uh, organizing Asian communities. Um, I currently have COVID, which is why I'm having a bit of a tough time talking. Um, but the people earlier, like our people can't really come to these hearings because they're at 10 a.m. And most people work jobs from like 9 a.m. to like 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m. And they work these jobs to support their families because the people I'm organizing, they live like five blocks from the proposed development side. The, there are like rent stabilized buildings there that are not being stabilized and their rents are rising by 25, 20%, 35% because of the speculation that has come with like this project. And this rent increase has happened in like the past six months from what we've seen. Other than that, like earlier, our people like have been sitting outside in this heat because most of them can't access Zoom, most of them can't speak English. Um, they've been sitting outside in the heat with my colleagues and they were promoted as panelists and then they were taken off. I don't know why. Um, yeah, and I think that as far as this project goes, this is unaffordable. $3,100 for a one bedroom studio, who's gonna live in that? Like people, immigrant people, especially immigrant people without families, they want to live with the families that they have here. When people move here, they need to live with their families in order to like incubate and be able to live here fully. If they can't do that, then they're going to die. And Astoria is a landing place for most immigrants, for most Bengali immigrants. Astoria is a landing place. It is where our businesses are. Alauddin, Boishaki, all of these amazing businesses, all of these amazing like um, people and the rent increases would take that away. The people would not be able to live there anymore. And I've seen that in person. I've seen that like when I went up. there. Pardon? Go on. I'm sorry. I think it was a misfire. Yes. Um, yeah, I just think that Innovation Queens as a project is unaffordable. Like, yes, 25% of the units are going to be affordable, but affordable to who? And the 75% of the units that are not going to affordable are going to like, you know, remove the people that are there already. People live with their old, like their senior family members, their children in one bedroom apartments in order to make it. And they do it so that they can live closer to their communities, closer to their families, closer to their home. And by approving this project, you would take that away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
let me uh, let me just check in here for a sec. We have a question for you from uh, Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair Gordon. More than a question, I just wanted to thank you for your testimony. I know that it's a big effort to participate in these hearings, and especially um, when you are sick. So I, I really appreciate that. I just wanted to encourage CAF to submit written testimony so that we can uh, hear your thoughts and recommendations. On the what would be more helpful is that Bilkis Begum is in the panel room right now with the other 10 leaders, and they would be open to speaking in language, and we have our organizers able to interpret. I believe that okay. that's uh, Kazi Mariam. Yes. Signed up. Yeah, we. she's she's on our next to she's speak. Coming, out. coming soon, coming soon. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, next we're going to call Adis Konovich. Forgive, here. Me if, forgive me if I have um, done an injustice to your name and feel free to correct me, but welcome. How are you guys? <clears throat> so I'm an immigrant. <laughs> I came here from Slovenia as a war refugee in 1998 for the Serbian-Bosnian War. I'm an immigrant. So now the minority is going to say, oh, but you're white. So it doesn't No, I'm an immigrant. I came here. I don't have a white name like Richard or Charlie. They got my resume with my name Addis on it with no picture of me. And I, I, I ended up buying a house. So if you're here and you want to plant your roots, uh, uh, do you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So if you're here and you want to plant your family roots, you have to buy a property here. And there's programs from the government, such as FHA loan, 3.5% down payment. And then you can go 5% down payment, 10%, so on and so forth. So that I'm going to push aside. Culture. I'm going to go to culture. Culture. There is, I think, over 50 or 60 permits right now being pulled for new developments in Astoria, Long Island City. It might be a bigger number. You can go on DOB to check the number. Department of Buildings, it's public record. Majority of those are bringing open uh, uh, free market apartments. So what's coming to Astoria is a lot of free market apartments. What's already in Astoria is already a four or $5,000 rent. So pushing this development away is not going to save you from these issues of not having affordable. Astoria is already unaffordable. It's going to go even further. Um, Astoria West is a building... Uh, did we did we lose? Yeah, we looks like we an action. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, let us. Uh, we we can uh, we can give him a, a chance to uh, to return to us uh, uh, for his remaining time later um, with te technical difficulties here. But let us, um, unless he is back already, let's proceed. Is there anybody, Is he is he back in the room? Uh, I don't see him now. Okay. All right. Let's proceed um, to uh, Kazi Mariam, and uh, we will um, uh, we can circle back as needed here. Kazi Mariam, are you there? Hi, Kazi is here with us. Um, my name is Korea Akhtar, and I am an organizer with CAV. Uh, Hello. Several of our folks who are um, here now ready to testify. Many of them were called earlier and uh, we're all on one laptop, so we weren't uh, able to speak then. Can our folks just go now? Uh, yes, you can go right ahead. Welcome. Okay, great. Guys, but please do identify yourself so we know who, we, uh, who we've who we gotten, who we missed here. Um, we, we, can, we can do this as a group. Ryan, that is... Uh, Yep, that's, that's perfectly fine. Good. Yep. Let's go ahead. Please proceed. Welcome. Okay. So, hi. Uh, my name is Faria Akhtar. I'm an organizer with CAV. Uh, my own father lives uh, just a mile or less than a mile away from the development site. The reality is that the developers are claiming no one really lives here. This is a decrepit area. That's not true. Over 6,000 working class Bengalis live here and they live here with their immigrant families. Astoria has long been a place of immigrants, of working class people, and it still is. 
the folks that I'm sitting with now have lived in this uh, area for the past 20 years <laughs> and they aren't paying $4,000 rents. But what we do know is that Innovation Queens is trying to bring uh, luxury market rate housing, the 25% set aside that's legally mandated, right? That's not just being given away out of kindness uh, is not enough. It is not at income bans that our folks can afford, that working class, black, brown, immigrant people can afford. And we've seen for a long time that just adding more market rate housing does not actually decrease rent prices. There is no place where that has been shown. And instead, what we see is that the vacancy rate of luxury housing of apartments at $2,300 or above are at a relatively high vacancy rate. I believe it's around 12%, whereas the rest of um, the city uh, is where where apartments under 1,400, under 2,200 even, are at uh, very minuscule vacancy rates. What we need is deeply affordable housing, not more luxury market rate housing. Our organizing efforts have been clear. Uh, We say no innovation queens. We ask that you disapprove this application. I'm going to pass it to um, the next person who is Tawhida Amin. She'll be uh, presenting in Bangla and I can interpret for her. Hello, Assalamualaikum. My name is Tawhida Amin. I'm a teacher in the এলাকার প্রধান সমস্যা হচ্ছে অতিরিক্ত বাসা ভাড়া আমার বাচ্চারাও আমার সাথে থাকে এখানে বাচ্চারা স্কুলে যায় আর পাশে বাঙালি সাথে আমাদের ভালো একটা সম্পর্ক আছে আমার বেতনের দুই তৃতীয়াংশই বাড়ি ভাড়ার পিছনে চলে যায় আমার দুই রুমের বাসা ভাড়া 2000 টাকার উপরে এখন বলি uh, so my name is Tawhida Amin. I have been living in Astoria for the past 18 years. The primary problem in this area is the excess rent. My children live here. They go to school here. I have built relationships with the Bengali community that lives here. Two thirds of my income goes into rent. Uh, my rent is $2,000. আমার আমার সাথে কোন ডেভেলপার এসে এই এই বিষয়ে কেউ কথা বলে নাই এই প্রকল্পের বিরুদ্ধে আমি আমাদের বাড়ি ভাড়া আরো বেশি বেড়ে যাবে যদি এই ধরনের প্রকল্প হয় আমার বাড়ি ভাড়ার আর এক টাকাও যদি বেড়ে যায় আমাদেরকে এই বাসা এখান থেকে চলে যেতে হবে তখন এই বাঙালি কমিউনিটি আমরা আর পাবো না হারিয়ে ফেলবো কিন্তু আমার বাচ্চারা স্কুলে যায় কাজ আমি কাজে যাই সংসারে রেখে যাওয়াটা অসম্ভব লাগে তাই আমি শক্ত কণ্ঠে বলছি আমি এটার বিরুদ্ধে ইনোভেশন কুইন্স এর রিজনিং এর বিরুদ্ধে আম সো দ্য ডেভেলপারস হ্যাভ নট uh spoken to us about or me about this project and i'm against this rezoning because it will increase our cost of living and our rent even more if our rent goes up at all uh we may have to leave and we would be displaced we would lose uh access to the bengali community here and i can't just pack up and leave uh, behind my life and my family that's here this is why i demand that you disapprove or vote no to this rezoning um next we're going to move to Shima Akhtar. Yeah, you can then. Bangla Bulletin. Bangla Bulletin. Okay. Hi, my name is Amunam Shima Akhtar. So, I'm a big fan of the Astoria. 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 আমাদের রক্ষণাবেক্ষণ সঠিকভাবে করা হয় না এবং আমরা এই এলাকায় বসবাসের জন্য এত বেশি ভাড়া পরিশোধ করলেও আমরা বাড়িওয়ালার ওকে আমরা বাড়িওয়ালার কাছ থেকে হয়রানির সম্মুখীন হচ্ছি নাকি পুরোটা বলে বলে নেন ওকে এই রিজনিং হলে বাড়ি ভাড়া বাড়বে আমি এই এলাকা ছেড়ে যেতে চাই না কারণ আমার বাচ্চারা এখানে পড়াশোনা করছে এবং নতুন জায়গায় সবকিছু নতুন করে শুরু করা এত সহজ নয় ভাড়া বাড়লে আমাদের অবস্থা আরো খারাপ হবে আমি তাই ইনোভেশন কুইন্সকে না বলছি সো my name is Shima Akhtar I've been living in Astoria for 11 years the rent is very high in this area it was hard to survive the pandemic with our income 
our maintenance is not done properly and we face harassment from the landlord even when we're paying these high rents to live in this area. If the rezoning happens, the rent is going to increase further. I don't want to leave this area because my kids are studying here and it's not easy to start over in a new place. Our conditions will get worse if our rents increase. I say no innovation, Queens. Uh, next, we'll move to Kazi Mariam. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Kazi Mariam. Um, I'm saying no to innovation, Queens. The reasons are the pop. There's a lot of mom and pop stores around the area. If these, if things change, there, these stores are not gonna be around anymore. And that's gonna be a big problem because us, we're, we're from Queens, we got the most immigrants. You're gonna end up kicking us all out and that's not fair. I have parents that have lived here. My parents lived here for 38 years. Um, for the past like two or three years, it's rent's been going crazy high. Parking's been hard to find. Um, people are complaining, immigrants, can't afford it. Um, we have people that are that that are middle class. They still can't afford it. Um, and then Queens is honestly not for sale. Queens is not for sale. Queens is for the immigrants. There's too many immigrants in Queens. Astoria itself is made up of like um, Bengalis. We have Egyptians. We have all types of people around here. Um, one bedroom apartment is a lot. Um, I'm sure when if things if things change, the rent is going to go up to like three, four thousand, which no one can afford. People can barely afford a thousand, two thousand now. Um, if Queen, uh, if Queens, re if Queens really cares about immigrants, this is not something that should take place. No one will be able to afford it. Um, if you say yes to Innovation Queens, you are literally supporting the rich and trying to take out the working class and immigrants. I'm gonna leave it there. Um, Next we have Delwar or Hossein Delwar. Hi, my bad. Hi, my name is Hossein Delwar uh, and I've been living in Astoria for pretty much my whole life. Uh, the, there are various communities here that allow for a very divi uh, diverse experience and not only growth, but also culture. A story is a melting pot and changes like Innovation Queens can be seen right next door at Queensborough Plaza. Projects like these may not present any trouble to those that are living at the plot, but it has shown trouble to those who live surrounding it after the project is done. Um, I mean, it can bring in problems such as rent hikes around, and also it brings in gentrification, which um, as we can see along the East River from Brooklyn to Queens. Projects like these kick down ethnic communities that many people call home. The Bengali community present in Astoria has taken years to build itself. So therefore, if a building project like this means to push down people from their homes, I most likely will in encourage you to vote no. Thank you. Hi, my name is Opatun Ridika and I've lived in Astoria my whole life for the last 22 years. Oh, and um, I believe that the rezoning is in no way beneficial for our neighborhood because this community is made up of immigrants and working class people. This community is very important to me. It's all that I know, and I don't want my family and friends to be displaced as well. The being pushed out by increasing rents would make our lives so much more difficult and impact our mental and emotional well-being as well. Many immigrant families call a story a home and deserve to decide what happens here and right. We are already struggling and this rezoning and development will only, only make things worse. I see my family struggling already to give me everything that I want and need as well. So to be able to upkeep with that and all the things that we need here, it's just hard to do all together at once. So I say that there should be no to the rezoning, to the development in Innovation. Hello, my name is Dinara Begum, and I have been living here in Australia since 26 years. And uh, I have uh, two children, they're growing up, they're born here actually, and they're growing up here. And uh, we are lots of suffering since, uh, you know, Corona. 
and um, we still be suffering for we get we don't get our raise but we get our everything going up all groceries and everything and rent also going high if uh, they make the development big high building is going to be <laughs> worse for us worse for us because uh, we can carry that much uh, rent you know and uh, that's why i don't like to develop uh, that much develop here we need uh, not luxury development we, we, and uh, okay yeah so but i'm saying no for this um, reasoning thank you thank you uh, next we have bilkis begum Hello, uh, I'm Anna Bilkis Begum. Got to Shabbatsu today and aspirate the Boshwash Kutsi. I'm a Kubi, all for Ayer Manush, put it in Kajanagele, I'm a Tabar Juga Roshum Bob Huesoni. Shake an Otimuler Baritori Hule, I'm a Baro Berejabe. Sheshate Berejabe, Drobumulo, I'm a Poke J by Nid Baho for a Shambhobna. Sheshate Dekajabe, I'm a Bari, Gulo, Hiraz Huajati. Karun business the Juno Labjono Kote, Malikeratai Kurbe. ফলাফল এখনি দেখা যাচ্ছে বাড়িওয়ালারা আমাদের ভাষাগুলোতে মেরামত দরকার তারা তা করছে না বাড়িগুলো মেরামত দরকার অসংখ্য সমস্যা জর্জরিত এরা কি ইচ্ছে করে মেরামত বা সারায়ের কাজ করছে না যাতে আমরা এই জায়গা ছেড়ে দেই আমরা এই জায়গা ছেড়ে দিতে চাই না কারণ আমরা আমাদের বাচ্চাদের স্কুল কাজের জায়গা নিজেদের আত্মীয়-স্বজন বন্ধু প্রতিবেশী সবাইকে নিয়ে ভালো আছি কোথাও যে নতুন শুরু করার মতো আমাদের শক্তি নেই আমরা আমাদের জায়গা ছাড়তে চাই না আমাদেরকে কৌশলে তাড়ানোর চেষ্টা করবেন না শুধু ব্যবসা নয় মানবিক দিকটা দেখুন এস্টোরিয়া বিক্রির জন্য নয় ইনোভেশন কুইজ কে না বলছি ওকে মাই নেম ইজ তিশা আই এম फ्रॉम কাউ এন্ড আই এম গোনা টু ট্রান্সলেট ফর হার হার নেম ইজ বিলকিস বেগম আই हैव बीन লিভিং হিয়ার ফর 7 ইয়ার্স we are very low income people if we don't go to work every day we have hard time to afford our meals if luxury buildings are made are made our rent is going to increase our living expense and price of commodity is also going to increase we can't afford this our houses are being broken down and also being transferred into high rise for rich people's profit and luxury our landlord is very ignorant towards our maintenance we get harassed and these ha hazardous conditions are pushing us out of our are pushing our low, our low wage working class folks out of their houses we don't want to leave astoria all my family friends and neighbor are here i love this multicultural neighborhood we live in we can't even afford to start our life somewhere else this mega project is going to displace and burden and burden our low income population don't just think about luxury profit and business please be human Astoria is not for sale. I say no to innovation queens. We have uh, Yasmin Begum who just got back from work. Yasmin. প্রায় তিন মাস ধরে আমাদের বাড়িতে কোন গ্যাস নেই বাড়িওয়ালা কি চায় আমি জানি না বাড়া এমনিতেই ভুজা এই পর্যায়ে এইভাবে বেঁচে থাকা কঠিন আমাদের আয় কম এবং এই প্রকল্পের জন্য ভারী ভাড়া বেড়ে যাবে যা আমাদের জন্য শাস্ত্রীয় নয় আমরা এত বেশি ভাড়া দিতে পারব না এই প্রকল্পের সম্পর্কে কোন আমার সাথে যোগাযোগ করে নি আমি এই মেগা প্রকল্পের তীব্র বিরোধিতা করছি আমি ইনোভেশন uh, and I'll interpret. Um, my name is Musamat Yasmin. Uh, she said, I'm tired. 
Uh, I've been living in Astoria for the past 30 years. 30 years. And we have ha had no gas in our apartment for the past three months. It's un I don't know what the landlord wants, but the rent is already a burden. At this stage, it's hard to live like this. We are low income and can't afford rent hikes that Innovation Queens will bring to this neighborhood. I don't remember any developer reaching out to me about this luxury project, and I strongly oppose this mega project. I say no Innovation Queens. Um, we Thanks. have the reality of this situation is that thousands of working class tenants, uh, immigrants, Bengali and otherwise, are opposed to this project because it will cause placement and rent hikes. The uh, standard of uh, what's legally required is not enough. Um, we know that this is about profit for the developers. And the housing crisis is caused by developers like this and luxury development that does not actually create deeply affordable housing. We urge the CPC to uh, deny this application and disapprove it. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much. And, and let me uh, just say to you and everyone assembled um, that we very much appreciate your taking uh, the time to be with us today. Um, we know that uh, it is difficult uh, to uh, sit and wait for the moment uh, to, uh, to have your chance here, uh, but we really appreciate your uh, being present, sharing your views, and participating in, in this process. It is, uh, it's meaningful, it's important, um, and we are, uh, we're very grateful to you for spending the time and taking the time uh, to be with us. Uh, let, me, uh, let me turn to Commissioner Bozarg. Um, who has a question or comment, um, and then on to Commissioner Bernie. Commissioner. Um, yes, thank you. I also just wanted to um, thank um, Kav and, and the folks that have gathered uh, to provide testimony. I know how challenging that can be, um, especially with working schedules. Um, I myself also, also grew up in a um, close-knit immigrant community. I, I know how important those networks are to um, uh, children growing up. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that we heard a number of things about people's experiences that um, I'm, I'm sure Kav is focused on that are obviously illegal, people's gas being turned off, et cetera. So I think, um, you know, I, I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, and I, I hope there are things that the city is being responsive to, to some of those issues. And if not, I hope there are other ways that, I know it's not in the commission's purview, but I, but I hope there are other connections that can be made um, to, to agencies that are responsible for responding to those issues. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, we are definitely organizing around those issues as well. But the reality is, given speculation, when landlords hear uh, that a major project like this is coming, what they want is to have their uh, apartments vacant so they can flip the buildings. And so we're seeing a lot of issues like this that are illegal, uh, but that have been ongoing for months, not just in this building, but several buildings in the surrounding area. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I share um, I share Commissioner Bozorg's uh, concern about ensuring that uh, legal protections are in place and that people have uh, resources to be able to push back against uh, bad acts um, in uh, an effort to take advantage of a moment. So um, I'm glad that Commissioner Bozorg made that point. She's absolutely correct. Um, and Commissioner Bernie, I'm going to go to you next. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to second uh, Chair Grodnick's uh, uh, compliment about your organizing and getting together as you have done. I don't think in the time I've been on the commission, I've seen a group presentation outdoors, all working off Kezi Marion's laptop. I mean, it's quite a, a feat of organization, extremely powerful testimony. And I think it just shows the power of organizing and, and the, what you can do as an organ, organizing a community. And uh, I compliment you for your testimony and uh, all, all power to you in the future. If I may, I, I would just like to add that we have uh, honestly uh, hundreds of people who are not able to be here today. Um, you know, this time and this format is incredibly inaccessible. Um, and so I would hope that you all keep that in mind as you make your decisions. Um, and not to add also that language interpretation, I see that you have interpreters on the line, but there's no way to actually hear the interpreted line. 
Mm-hmm. And so unless you speak English, you can't yeah. engage. Yeah. But also bear in mind, you could submit written testimony that's then distributed to all the commissioners. So that's also a second uh, way to overcome some of the obstacles of the difficulties of testifying. Th- thank you very much. Commissioner Osorio. Thank you. Um, thanks again for for all of the work entailed to organize and uh, allow us to hear directly from the community. I wanted to follow up on a couple comments that I heard uh, regarding the type of jobs that the community relies on. Can you explain a little bit what those jobs are and where are they located to allow the community to afford rent in Astoria? Well, the way that people afford rent is honestly by overcrowding in apartments and with everyone working low wage jobs, the jobs that Innovation Queens talks about will not actually be accessible to most of the working class people that live here. And most of them would not be high paying enough to actually afford the apartments that would be deemed affordable in this project. Um, We have folks who do housekeeping work, who are taxi drivers, who uh, are clerks at grocery stores, restaurant workers. Um, And so their primary concern is making sure that they don't get displaced from this neighborhood and increasing rents will cause their displacement. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thanks again to all assembled. We appreciate your uh, your time uh, and we certainly have uh, heard your comments and appreciate them. Uh, so we're gonna move on in today's hearing uh, to the next person who actually is a uh, return uh, uh, testifier. I got cut off midstream. We have Mr. Kalenovich back in the room. Uh, Mr. Klanovich, when you are ready, I'm going to give you half your time back, a minute and a half. So please uh, go right ahead and we'll try to hang on to you this time. All right. Do you guys hear me? We hear you. All right. Let me just put it on speaker. Uh, boom. Hear me now? Yes. yes, we hear you. Beautiful. So <clears throat> back to what I was saying. I'm an immigrant. I came here as a war refugee. My mother was a cleaner and she retired a cleaner. She used to clean uh, homes and and my mother was a cleaner. My mother doesn't speak English. She speaks it, but broken. My father worked as a laborer in a tile shop on 31st Avenue. I went to PS84, IS141, William Cullen Bryant, right? All right. There is rent stabilized apartments. Are, uh, there's uh, food stamps, there's programs, there's a lot of programs that are offered by the city. Um, if you get a, there's many rent stabilized apartments in the story. If you get one of those, you're locked in for a certain raise for the next few years. So there's ways to combat these issues, right? Now, majority of Astoria now, Astoria was primarily immigrant when I was growing up in late 90s, early 2000s. It was primarily immigrant. Astoria, I'm sorry to say, is no longer primarily immigrant. Now, Astoria looks like the Upper East Side. So when you ask Astoria and say, hey, listen, we're going to build the building. I think 25 percent affordable housing is fair. Given that if I had to assume, I would assume 25% of Astoria is immigrant or 30%, whatever it is. Now they're saying, oh, it's uh, they're doing it for profit. Yes, this is a private organization that's going to the city and saying, hey, listen, I'm going to do my business like every other developer. But listen, I'll, I'll give you guys 25% of 700 apartments affordable. They're being nice for doing that. Now, on the other side, if you raise their percentage of affordable housing, they're paying less property tax. So uh, you're arguing. So I've heard somebody say at the, uh, the meeting, they're like, give 100 percent affordable housing. Like, all right. So then the city should build that. Go to the city. Don't go to this private developer. You know, this is a business. Um, uh, I know a lot of uh, Bangladeshi and all these people. They're very hardworking, very good, very honest people. But I know a lot of them that opened businesses, that bought properties, that got rent stabilized apartments. I know a lot of them. I work with a lot of them. I'm in construction, you know. So uh, what I'm trying to say is 
The city has established issues. Coming on to here and speaking about gas problem, I understand that is bad. That is no good. But there's agencies for that. You can't come to a private developer that's trying to get approved plans to do a development and offer 25% affordable housing. Hey, my gas is out. No, that's not how you do it. So um, saying, oh, these uh, landlords are trying to raise rents. Uh, this They've been doing this for a long time. So trying to raise rents and that, that's just not, it's a business. We're in a, we're in a, a, a capitalism country. This is just what it is. But the city offers nice programs like rent stabilization, food stamps, um, so on and so forth. Uh, Astoria rents are going to continue going up as they have been going. So this issue, if you push this developer away, you won't get 700 apartments uh, potentially. Helping out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for um, for coming back and and finishing your thoughts, we appreciate it. And I also do think that your um, your reminder is an important one, particularly as it relates to the dynamic uh, at play on what is required of private interests and what the city has the ability to deliver on its own. Um, you know, MIH as a program, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna uh, applaud any private interest for uh, you know for doing it, it is their obligation, and it is the thing that is delivering us, in the cases where MIH is applied, affordable units on a developer's dime, uh, which of course is why that program was created. It is uh, the most aggressive in the country, and it is a requirement for good reason. And it, and it is a, an effort to try to strike a balance between what you could accomplish what you could get in terms of affordability out of a private development versus what would make a project not viable. Um, and that was a carefully crafted program, which I had the privilege of voting on when I was in the city council as, as an effort to try to require more of private interests and to deliver affordable housing to the maximum extent possible on their dime as a result of the opportunity that was being created for them. Uh, and so I think that that is important to, to remember. And I think you have, you, you gave me the moment which I felt like it was the right moment to, to, to say out loud. I also will note that there are opportunities to go to the hundred percent affordable projects. And those are usually the ones that are sponsored by the city uh, where the city has a uh, land that it is able to partner with a private developer uh, it, its cost is lower because the land is essentially free. Uh, and we see those uh, coming before the City Planning Commission routinely. Uh, in fact, we saw one earlier today. Um, and so it is uh, another really important tool for us uh, as we think about ways to deliver affordable housing uh, to New Yorkers. Um, so, uh, and as I as we sit here, we've heard from the applicant team, they are in the middle of conversations. Of course, this is not a settled point yet, uh, but conversations with the city about whether there are ways to add additional specifically affordable buildings within the mix here. That is still an open question. And as others have pointed out, you know, not a, not a done deal. So we will just, you know, factor that in as we consider all of this. But to your point, sir, uh, there is a difference between private industry here and public sponsored sites. Uh, and I just think it was a, it's just worth uh, just taking a moment to, uh, to recognize that. So thank you for, uh, for mentioning it. Um, let us uh, move on. Uh, we are going to hear from Ali. Oh boy, you forgive me now. I'm gonna do this right. But if I make a mistake, please forgive me. Uh, Sayed Amadian. Ali Sayed Amadian. Hello. Yep. That was close yeah. enough. Close, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Tell me the tell me the precise though, so I get it right uh, next say, time. Say Sayed Ahmadia. Say Ahmadia. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. So, hello, everybody. I am here to talk in support of Innovation Queens. I work in Long Island City, and I live in Sunnyside. Um, I think one of the major problems that we're seeing that causes increases in rents is the major supply shortage of housing that we have, not only in New York, but in all of America. Uh, the latest report that I saw is that we have 3.8 million units. We are 3.8 million units short all across America. And one of the reasons that we're seeing this increase in 
and rent prices is because there's more demand but less supply. I personally looked for two months just this summer to find a place to live in um, as I was looking to change houses and be closer to work. And there is one of there is very limited supply. Everything is expensive, but one of the one of the ways that we can alleviate that is to build new developments such as Innovation Queens. And in addition to that, I also work in advanced manufacturing uh, for the architecture industry. And I think not only the jobs that will be created for the community by businesses that will be accommodated in the Innovation Queens development, but also the construction jobs that will create will be a big boost to the local Queens economy. So uh, to, to sum it all up, I, um, I live in Queens. I work in Queens. I'm also a second generation immigrant. And I believe that this is incredibly important for the progress of our city. Um, and that, that's to summarize. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, question or comment from Commissioner Osorio. Thank you very much for your testimony. Can you expand a little bit on the opportunities associated with advanced manufacturing provided by or proposed by the applicant? Uh, in terms of the Innovation Queens development or in terms of my, my no. discussion of support? In terms of the the proposal, the innovation, uh, the in terms of the proposal, um, you know, we have been an active uh, member of Queens Tech Night, uh, which is a support for bringing more tech opportunities to Queens as a a, a job growth factor, and um, we, you know, we have been very proudly supported by um, businesses in Queens. And we, the, the LICP partnership, um, in addition to other factors and uh, board members on, on Queens Tech Night had been incredibly supportive of not only the businesses that are in Queens currently, but I think that, you know, in terms of the planning, they have incubation spaces and maker spaces for the community that I, I can encourage not only professionals to come in, but people at a young age to kind of grow and get interested in these. Um, in these endeavors. Does that answer your question? Or? Well, I, I specifically wanted to know it, to what extent do you feel that the proposal will help advanced manufacturing in the community or support advanced manufacturing in the community? So uh, in terms of job growth, yeah, you know, we are an advanced manufacturing company specifically catered for construction and architecture. Um, the, the jobs that the, the construction will only bring will add a lot of opportunities for um, for new hires. Um, we we're we're a growing company. Last year, I was the seventh employee to join the company in 2021. Now we're at 25, and that's where because we're seeing a boom in construction in in New York, um, led on by some of the housing shortage crises that I mentioned before. So I think uh, you know there there are a lot of opportunities that, that such a development can bring to the local economy. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> uh, thank you, sir. Let us move on in our hearing. Uh, we appreciate your being with us very much. Uh, let me thank move on much. to Silas Levitt to be followed by Tom Greck. Mr. Levitt. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Silas Levitt. I'm the Housing Development Coordinator at Hanek Inc. Uh, I'd like to thank you for hearing my testimony today uh, regarding the Innovation QNS project. So, Hanek is a nonprofit founded in 1972 in Astoria and is a city based social service and affordable housing development organization. For the past 20 years, Hanek has played an ever expanding role as a social services provider and affordable housing developer in the city of New York. Currently, the organization serves over 30,000 New Yorkers annually through our social services and affordable housing, provided a wide range of programs to youth, adults, and seniors. Uh, through our senior residences, Hanek also currently provides affordable housing to approximately 1,000 seniors. Um, we at Hanek first met with the Innovation QNS team in the spring of 2020, when the project partners reached out to us to hear our feedback on their proposal and to learn more about the services that Hanek provides to seniors. Uh, shortly after that, Hanek and the Innovation QNS team formed a partnership as both parties felt that our decades of experience operating senior affordable housing in Astoria made us the ideal organization to run Innovation QNS as senior affordable housing. For the Innovation Queens project, we'll be working as the MIH administering agent overseeing the lease up of the affordable units. 
Uh, we are HPD certified administrative agent for the mandatory inclusionary housing program and have extensive experience in the marketing and lease up of the affordable units through the HPD Housing Connect lottery process. Um, the need for housing and senior housing in New York City and in Queens is especially high and poised to grow even higher. Currently, the wait list for senior housing is something like five and a half years. Um, it, the Innovation QNS project will not only create additional affordable and supportive homes for seniors and for other members of the community, it will also integrate these residences into a larger community, right, with open space, healthcare facilities, and ground floor spaces operated by local nonprofits and neighborhood serving businesses. Access to affordable housing and holistic services like the ones proposed by the Innovation QNS project are important components of helping our seniors gracefully age in place in their neighborhoods. Uh, so I'd like to thank you again for hearing my t testimony in support of the project, and I uh, yield the rest of my time. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can, you, can you just describe a little, in a little greater detail the relationship between Hannock and the, and the uh, proposal here and how it all, how it all, uh, how it all works? Because obviously we've been having conversations here about the MIH portion of the project. You know, Hannock is a component part here. Just if you could lay it out for us, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, uh, speaking specifically to the MIH portion of the project, um, those are affordable units and there are certain sort of statute requirements and how those units are leased up and who they're leased up to. Uh, and so it requires a nonprofit like us to oversee that portion of the project. So we would be working with the Innovation Queens team and whoever is ends up providing the property management to um, lease up those units in accordance with the HPD requirements. Uh, and then additionally, we would continue to serve in an administering role as those units continue forward and, and ensure that when they when there's turnover in the units that they are uh, released according to the same affordability procedures. Okay, um, and forgive me. Uh, so obviously you become the, the partner for the purpose of uh, processing the, uh, the leasing up of affordable units pursuant to the statutory requirements. You noted um, the creation of additional affordable home seniors. Talk about that too. Yeah, I, I think that the, the Innovation Week team is still in conversations about what that would entail. Uh, you know, whether it, it's an additional building just for seniors or it's something that's part of the rest of the project. But um, so, so I think they're, I believe that they're still exploring several options of what that might look like. But if that were to come to pass, then we would also work with them to be, uh, you know, the property management provider or the social services provider for the seniors in those buildings. Okay. Um, you know, there has been some concern about the lack of certainty on a variety of these points raised by members of the community um, uh, and elected officials. Um, what, what would you say about that? I mean, we are, we're at the city planning commission level in this process. Obviously we're not the end of the process. We're at the beginning and toward the end, but we're not the end. Uh, what would you say about the, the point of certainty here and how one would need to evaluate the possibility of affordable homes for seniors as an additional component part here as they're weighing their, uh, you know, uh, their decision. Yeah, I, I think the, the weighing of the options is related to what sort of uh, subsidies or programs are available from HBD for what the affordable additional affordable housing units are going to look like. Um, so I know that we're discussing doing Sarah and discussing doing uh, Ella and discussing also what a mix and match program might look like for uh, additional affordable units in the development. A and so uh, the fact that those conversations are still ongoing is contributing to what the uncertainty is. And, and so it, I think it's a little bit of, uh, you know, a catch-22 in, the, in that there, I would imagine that the developers don't want to commit for certain until they know what exactly uh, is the funding available and what they need to do to bring more affordable housing to the project. And at the same time, you guys, are debating about the uncertainty of what units are afforded in the project going forward. So I, I just think that there's a little bit uh, stuck at this moment in time. Yeah, and I, I think that's, uh, that's, a fair, that's a fair point. I recognize that the, the developers may very well want to expedite this process 
to the max, which I think they even said as much when they appeared before us uh, this morning. The community may want more certainty on these points and the process itself may only go as fast as it is able uh, to go. Um, so I do think that that is a, that is a challenge and we certainly uh, have to um, look at, at our point right here, the, the 700 affordable units, which are the ones which are MIH, uh, because those are the ones that are presently um, you know, required and before us. And the additional points are, you know, if there is certainty to be gained, uh, it will exist. And I would expect that that would benefit both the uh, developer here and also the community interests that are looking for a little bit more certainty. So we uh, certainly encourage you uh, uh, along that path and, and appreciate your, uh, your sharing some of those details. Um, so thank you. Okay, um, yeah. let us go on to, uh, to Tom Grech. Uh, to be followed by uh, Davin Lomax. Tom Greck is not in the room, uh, neither is Davin Lomax. How about Cynthia Davis? Cynthia is in the room. Great, Cynthia, Ms. Davis, welcome. Ms. Davis, are you there? Uh, you should be able to unmute. I am here. There Can you go. Me? Yes. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I was going to say good morning. I've been here since nine o'clock from the first one. So it's great to see all you guys. And thank you for giving the Floating Hospital a chance to speak. So my name is Cynthia Davis, and I'm the Director of Community Outreach for the Floating Hospital. And we fully support the Innovation Queens Project. In Astoria, there's a lack of essential services for the community, and the Innovation Queens Project will bring in much needed community-based organizations that will provide much needed services to the community. We are also thrilled to see 2,800 units of houses being built, with 700 of those units being permanently affordable. Commercial real estate for the size that we need is not really commercially available and affordable in Astoria. Development projects like this are one of the few opportunities charity hospitals like the Floating Hospital have to expand its services for those who need it. If this project goes through, the Floating Hospital will be able to combine at least 11,000 square feet of clinic with the 10,000 square feet of affordable day care program. In addition, the Floating Hospital can make family medical practices along with some limited mental health services and a full service pharmacy for one-stop convenience for family singles in the media area. We can also offer our good health shuttle service to the main clinic site, which here is in Long Island City, for dental, podiatry, eye care, and other services. We cannot, and I'm gonna repeat this, we cannot offer emergency room services are those required connection to a traditional hospital bed service program. The daycare services that we can offer will include reserved spots for staff, primarily affordable daycare options, because we all know that daycare today is really, really high and is not affordable. Rent subsidies due to this project are the only way that these types of services can be made available within this community. So again, the Floating Hospital, who's been around since 1866, fully, fully, fully support the Innovation Queens Project. And thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much. Any questions? We, we appreciate your being here with us. Um, I don't see any questions, so thank you for that. We will move on now to uh, Jenny Dubnow. Um, to be followed by um, Faria Akhtar. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I just want to quickly point out that the senior housing would only be built if the developers get city subsidies 
and they are considered part of the 25% of affordable housing. So it's not like the developers are really giving the community that much of a gift with that. I'm going to just echo quick, I don't wanna repeat all the wonderful points that were made about the inadequate AMI levels and the lack of actual affordability. I'm just gonna echo what everyone else said in the, in the interest of time. But I do wanna point out we're being left with a project that is at least 85 to 90 percent unaffordable to the immigrant and working class population of Astoria and granting an upzoning as massive as this, not to mention flipping the use for manufacturing to residential mixed use, drastically raises the value of this land with a resulting windfall of profit for the developers. In this context, it is astonishing that the project isn't mandated to be 75 to 80 percent deeply affordable. If the city is granting a rezoning, city agencies and the public deserve a transparent look at the developer's projected, projected profit margins to help us determine what affordability levels would really, quote, pencil out, particularly important since we have just learned that any additional affordability would be subsidized by HPD. We must also account for the secondary displacement of massive luxury developments such as these from Williamsburg to downtown Brooklyn to LIC we see surrounding rents skyrocket as a result of these luxury towers. The supply demand thing does not work. Rents go up, they do not go down. Local renters, especially in unregulated units are priced out as are small businesses. As city planners, you need to take this racial and economic displacement into account. I also need to say a word as an artist, a working artist. Innovation Queens with Astoria Calvin Studios and Momi speak of an arts district that will be created. But again, the reality is this high-end development always brings rising rents, which actually price out working artists and cultural organizations, except for the lucky few who are tossed a goodie. I will mention that Pioneer Works, a Brooklyn-based arts organization who is an original Innovation Queens partner, seems to have pulled out of this project uh, possibly because over 200 artists and neighbors signed an open letter requesting that they do so. As planners, we depend on you to protect New York City culture in our city, and it's being strangled by sterile, unaffordable environments brought by these types of developments. Astoria is already a thriving cultural district. We need more support for local artists and cultural workers, not less. And the last thing we need is soaring rents. I'm actually also going to mention that there is a community petition that has over 3,000 signatures right now. The, the feeling of your average New Yorker and Astoria resident is so powerful against this development. We've seen it time and again. I'm a native New Yorker. I've seen so many, I've been priced out over and over and I'm a middle-class white person. I've seen neighborhood after neighborhood destroyed by this kind of development and we need to rethink it. We need a new paradigm. And yes, the city should be building and the state should be building and the feds should be building social housing that is 100% deeply affordable. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Commissioner Osorio. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up question. I'm hoping that you can include the petition as part of the written testimony, but can you briefly summarize what that's asking for? Yeah, we, we are. I mean, all the points that everyone has made are basically reiterated in this petition. The lack of affordability, I think, is the biggest problem that most of us have with it. Um, the fact we, we know in our guts and in our bones because we've seen it and we live it that displacement is what results. The supply and demand issue simply doesn't work in real life. It might work in an economics 101 classroom, but we do not see it working. And I think many of us feel that the MIH concept has not worked because it doesn't demand nearly enough of developers and it actually gives them more of a profit. And we have a very big problem with secondary displacement. We also mentioned in the petition um, the, the kind of, destruction of our air and light, which is frankly a very important human issue for all communities. The strain on in our infrastructure, uh, pre-pandemic, as people have mentioned, you couldn't get onto the subway. You had to let three or four subways pass. If we're gonna bring this many people into the community, it really should be 100% affordable if there's gonna be this much of a strain on the infrastructure. Um, so all of those issues are mentioned. And I, and also I need to mention, you know, other people, and I think you have brought up the manufacturing issue. That is an issue that is super important and also the impact on local small businesses. Innovation Queens, this, this area is not blighted before these low rise manufacturing buildings were emptied out by the developers who have been sitting on them. This is, the city needs manufacturing. This is where higher paying jobs exist, not putting avocado toast, you know, not, not low wage service economy jobs. We need more and to protect our higher paying manufacturing sector. This was not a blighted area. 
it was a thriving manufacturing area. And we, you know, we need to change our definition of what a thriving economy looks like. And I don't think that these sterile glass towers with lots of, you know, immigrant owned and white working class owned manufacturing businesses, um, I don't think that's a good trade off for the community and for the city in terms of our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and Ms. Dubna, uh, thank you for your uh, for your testimony. And I, I will just note, I think um, I, I heard you make the point that uh, um, you would like to see more affordability in the project, particularly uh, as it relates to uh, existing infrastructure and just the general community dynamic and need for affordable housing. Um, uh, I also heard you say that uh, you don't, you perhaps would not credit the developer with uh, delivering additional affordable units if it is not on their dime, if it's a program that's being sponsored with an HPD subsidy. Um, and I believe I heard that correct. The only point I wanted to just note for, for clarity is that if at the end of the day, and you know, we, we do not have any certainty on this point today, uh, if the the developer were to add additional senior affordable units, that would not be counted toward the 700. It would be above the 700. Uh, the 700 is the MIH portion only. Um, any additional programs that they might avail themselves of, anything additional that they might do, that is above the 700. Where that lands, whether that would be adequate to uh, all decision makers, separate question, uh, but I did just want to make that note. And I really do appreciate your, uh, your testimony. Um, we, uh, we're, we're very glad to hear from you and also understand that you, you waited some time to testify. So to everybody who's taken the time and energy to do that, we really are appreciative. Okay, um, let, let, me, um, uh, let me move on. I'm going to call a few people here, which I, some of whom may have already uh, been part of the group earlier, but just in an abundance of caution here, I just want to call them again. Um, so Faria Akhtar and Nishat Akhtar, <laughs> um, uh, let's see, um, that is, uh, uh, are, the, are, are these, are these folks in the room still, Ryan? These, they're not in the room. Um, we all will go back and listen closely and also reach out to ensure if, if they were part of the group that spoke or whether okay. or not. Okay, great. And John yeah. Bahia? Also not in the room, yeah. We'll, uh, I'll Mason agree. Van Giesen? Uh, Mr. Van Giesen is, is in the room, I believe. Okay. Uh, Mr. Van Giesen, then it is your moment. Welcome. Hi there. Can y'all hear me? We can. Sorry. <laughs> um, no worries. It happens all the time. <laughs> all right. So I am an Astoria resident, young professional, artist. Uh, I'm speaking with you today, and I've been sitting here for a long time. Uh, to speak here with you today because I care deeply about the future of my neighbors and my neighborhood and because I am opposed to innovation queens. I cannot express to you how worried I am that an influx of market rate apartments like the ones proposed for the innovation queens complex are going to raise our area rents, raise our property taxes, and that'll price out people like me and my neighbors, people who already call the story a home and who help a story to thrive. Apartments in innovation queens would be prohibitively expensive for most of the people who live here. The development inherently would not be for us. But if a development doesn't serve the needs of the community where they want to build, who is it for? We're your neighbors. We're your community. The developers are not, and they don't have the interests of our community in heart when they're pursuing this project. The project may indeed be a large investment for the developers, but it's not an investment in us. It's an investment for which we will bear the greatest cost and risk. As signified for the Astoria, by the Astoria Not For Sale petition, which, as we've heard earlier, currently holds over 3,100 signatures, this community does not consent. No superficial changes or vague hollow comments that the developers are making now can change that. We do have a housing crisis in New York City, it's true, but it's first and foremost an affordability crisis. On May 16th, the Innovation Queens team replied to a tweet from the New York Housing Conference claiming that, quote, with a rental vacancy rate of just 2.8%, well under the citywide average of 3.5%, Astoria needs more housing. However, that tweet from the NYHC cited the real problem, which Innovation Queens ignored. We need affordable housing in every neighborhood. While New York has a low vacancy rate as a whole, there is so much more to that picture. According to the New York City Housing and Vacancy Survey, the city has a high rental vacancy rate, 
what we've already heard, right? 12.64% on apartments priced above $2,300 a month, which is what's being proposed here. Well, vacancy rates on genuinely affordable units are like nothing, but the developers continue to propose luxury complexes that nobody can afford. And the community is telling you clearly we don't want. The survey also found that between 2017 and 2021, there was a net loss of about 96,000 units with rents less than 1,500 and a net increase of 107,000 units with rent of $2,300 or more. Can the incomes of families here in Astoria keep up with that? We all know they can't. It's a shame that our city, our neighborhood faces a housing crisis while luxury units sit empty because they were never built to serve the surrounding community in the first place. And what about those affordable units proposed for this development? The developers have offered the bare mandated minimum of 25% affordable units. As much as I strongly believe that all new housing in Astoria should be 100% affordable, I was initially willing to consider the possible benefits of new affordable units to our current community. However, upon closer inspection, it becomes clear that these units would still be out of reach for me and so many of my neighbors. The income minimums needed to apply to even these affordable units are unattainable for most households in Astoria, mine included, and my household includes two working adults. It's simply not real affordable housing, especially for those in Astoria who need it most. It feels disingenuous to present it as such. The Innovation Queen's development would not resolve any part of the affordability crisis, and it would in fact exacerbate the very issue it misleadingly claims to solve. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And also to you, thank you for uh, your patience and uh, taking the time to uh, uh, to be here. I. Uh, I suppose to the extent that there's any silver lining in any of that is that uh, we're able to do that remotely. So um, uh, that is the, that's the only positive, but uh, I recognize you spent a lot of time and we appreciate it. We heard you loud and clear, so thank you. Um, okay, uh, I am going to move on. We have, I understand we do not have Kevin Foley or John Carlo Pinto uh, in the room. So I'm going to move to Rich Kuzami. Mr. Kuzami, yes, are you? Hello. How are you? Hello, Mr. Kuzami. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm Richard Kuzami. I'm the president of the Old Astoria Neighborhood Association. I'm also a 22-year member of the Community Board One, though I am speaking to you just as a president of the Old Astoria Neighborhood Association. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, the fact that since 2010, OANA, or Old Astoria, has been asking for a contextual rezoning of the area to the south of the 2010 Astoria rezoning to no avail. Uh, there have been previous attempts to rezone and develop this neighborhood over the years, um, and we, we keep asking for a contextual neighborhood rezoning to no avail. Uh, we still have not got this large scale area rezoning so we can have an effective context. We were looking for a holistic look at this whole neighborhood between Dutch Kills and the 2010 uh, rezoning. We also must keep in mind that the development site because of its location and accessibility to transit is primed to be developed. This is the third attempt. This neighborhood will not remain static. We trust uh, that with good faith negotiations by all parties, responsible development can be achieved. Our primarily issues are, upon seeing the shadow study, we would like to see if the taller structures uh, could be lowered and move closer to Northern Boulevard. The shadows cast will affect the quality of life, particularly for the two and three story residential buildings north of 35th Avenue. So please readdress this. We also need to factor in how much open space may be lost. Uh, we have to decide whether creating open space is for the for birds or for people. So this is an important distinction to make. Um, if you lower the building, the footprint is larger and you lose open space. We also feel that the most effective way of keeping housing costs down is supply and demand, which means we need to make the supply of housing exceed demand, as happened during the pandemic when rents did fall 35% in the area. This means that we should should not be afraid to build even market rate apartments. When you keep eliminating developments and demand exceeds supply, you end up with areas like Sutton Place and the West Village, only for the very rich. In today's society, affordability is an urgent issue. New York City has sustained itself historically by attracting the most innovative, ambitious people from all over the USA and the world, regardless of their socioeconomic status. We must make sure that there is no economic barriers to these new residents. Also, there are a few existing residents on the site that would actually be displaced. And this is private land, which makes 
uh, gaining funding to build the 100% affordable uh, buildings that some have called for almost impossible. However, we must make sure that no one has to move in the general neighborhood because of any cost increases caused by the development. So let's come up with a number that offers neighborhood stability and an acceptable return Time. on investment so funding can be secured. Great, thank you very much. Um, thanks for your testimony, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm gonna call next uh, Chris Hanway. There you are. Mr. Hanway, hello. Good afternoon, Commissioner and Commission uh, Commission members. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Chris Hanway, and I am the Executive Director of Jacob A. Reese Neighborhood Settlement, a 135-year-old community-based organization operating at eight sites throughout Western Queens, including at PS 166, which is just a block or two away from the proposed development site. Resettlement is a proud part of the Settlement House movement, operating on the principles of intergenerational place-based work, guided by reciprocity, and focused on the assets, strengths, and social capital of the community and the people in it. It is in that spirit that we strongly support the Innovation Queens project, and this is why. The project supports the people of the community we serve in several key ways. A, it provides a significant number of affordable housing units for low and moderate income residents, including seniors. I understand not all of them are affordable, but if you look at the numbers, a good deal of them are. B, it offers a significant amount of open, green, recreational, and public space in an area where it was sorely needed. C, it will bring hundreds of living wage sustainable jobs, many of them union jobs to Western Queens, and D, it allows about a dozen nonprofit and community-based organizations, including resettlement, to expand their operations and offer vital life-changing and empowering services to the diverse and growing community. The nonprofits will be able to expand programming for the members of the community that runs the gamut from workforce development, English language classes, and other services for immigrants, including healthcare uh, for low-income and housing unstable New Yorkers, protection and programming for the LGBTQI plus community and support and community building for our elders. Every development project involves significant difficult decisions and change can be difficult for a storied and proud community as vibrant and engaged as Astoria. But Resettlement strongly believes this project led by longtime community supporters and partners, Kaufman Astoria Studios will bring multiple benefits and is a strong plus for Western Queens. I thank you for allowing me to speak today. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we, we appreciate it. Uh, let's move to uh, Nahid Akhtar. Nahid. Okay, there we go. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Nahid Akhtar. There, and I'm fully support this project. I'm living 3707 36th Avenue, A block as tenant since 1994 with my husband, Mohammed, who's living here since 1989. Now my son, Mohammed Ali, he is with us since 2002. He grew up here. He are fully support Innovation Queen project. This project is really, really good for uh, community and new generations in future. Affordable home, senior citizen home, health program, tech education, just Jacob Rees, theater, food court, offices, children park, new business, new jobs for all age groups. So we want to see modern change. We, we like the new taste of food. We like the new style of fashion, new dress, new friend, new furniture. Why not the new homes, new buildings? That's the 100 years old buildings. We, don't, we want to see the new everything because it's a new tech, new school, medical opportunity for the new, lot of new opportunities for new generation. And I think it's the all group of age too. 
So my urge is people of Astoria fully support this project. Thank you for listening to me for bright future of Astoria. I am supporting innovation of Queen. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Let, let us move on to Christian Diaz. Uh, Mr. Diaz is here. Yeah, should be able to speak, Mr. Diaz. Here we go. Hello? Yep. We can can hear you hear me? You. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if I can be seen. Oh, okay. Hi. All right. I'm going to start. Uh, I've been here since the morning. Thank you for doing this. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of issues that people are trying to put together, but it seems to be, yes, we live in a capitalist world and you can buy whatever you want. But, you know, if this is a community, sorry if I'm too close. You can see I'm in Long Island City right now. Whatever community used to exist, if there even is a fragment, it's deeper. A couple of streets up, so. You know, you could turn the world upside down, but if you really want to talk about community, it's not working as far as development. You have to develop and help our neighbors and our friends who have grown up here. I live in the fucking streets. Excuse me, that's what's great. Myself, people dealing with issues. People coming here now are people from the inner part of the country, people from other countries. This city is being designed to compete with other world-class cities because this city doesn't invest in its actual community. It invests in bringing more money to people. It's like a casino. So yeah, sure. Go ruin Astoria just like every other neighborhood is getting ruined and that's fine. People will find somewhere else to live. But New York City is not a community anymore. And if you wanna work on community, you can't talk about money and you have to look at the actual problems that happen when you just boast about meeting minimum requirements of protecting humans. Not everyone is born with the same opportunities. I was humbled to see the building that I grew up in show up and speak at length about issues like gas, because yes, it is related, because the city is fucking drowning. When it rains, it's horrible. You're gonna build and build and build for no reason. There are enough homes, believe it or not. The right statistics aren't being taken for the right people. They sleep on the avenues, you ignore them, you can't help them. This is the world we're creating and they're not gonna get pushed out. That's why people complain about Times Square forever and they always will be. That's the center of the world. Go look at how messed up it is. That's what we're creating in our communities. There's no community when you talk about money. And it's, it's a shame growing up here. It really is because I don't wanna live here anymore just because I can't actually live in Astoria. 36th Avenue's ruined for people who their parents have died, you know? That's something that you don't play in the cars, but a lot of people's parents die and they move out, they get kicked out at a young age. Troubled community people, they don't care about that. That's fine, but this is a community that they're building on. They could sell out society. The jabroni who went to William C. Bryan High School that I went to, it's awesome when you're able to make money and be successful and forget your roots. You know, and everyone yelling about money, money. Yeah, because when you earn money, you have to earn it off the sweat of your back and it hurts, it kills you so much that it creates this egotistical pride where you think everyone needs to cross that bar just like you did. That's not the society that welcome me in. Bringing all these tourists in, of course, they're Time. just going to enjoy the new place. They're not going to care about anything. The most... You Thank, Thank you very much. You got as a New Yorker, it's maybe a little plaque in some... Thank you. Um, I'm sorry that you were muted. Um, I think you hit the hit the three minute mark. Um, so our, our apologies uh, about that, but we uh, we do appreciate your testimony. Um, okay, uh, we're moving on to Colin White to be followed by Ernie Brooks.
Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Hi there, my name is Colin White. I'm an Astoria resident and the Innovation Queen's proposal has me deeply worried for the future of my household, our neighbors and our neighborhood. The large number of luxury market rate units proposed by the Innovation Queens project will lead to increases in area rents and property taxes that would be untenable for the people who have already lived, worked, and invested their lives into this neighborhood. We have seen evidence of the effects of <clears throat> excuse me, similar kinds of developments right next door in Long Island City. According to a recent study by Rent Hop, the developments around Queensborough Plaza have led to a 28.6% increase in area rent, and the area around the 36th Street EMR station has faced a 29.6% increase. We cannot afford to compound the problem of already rampant rent increases by flooding the market with hugely expensive market rate units. Even if some of the units surrounding are, being, are rent stabilized currently, that does not mean that they will stay that way as I have been made intimately aware by my own journey of trying to maintain housing in the city. This will have a devastating impact on the most vulnerable members of our community and won't spare anyone but those who have already lived, who already have the most options and means. The billionaires behind this project plan to only build the legally mandated minimum of affordable units, but the minimum income requirements of their proposed affordable units will already impede those who need housing the most from having access. They have produced no adequate plan to bolster our already overtaxed infrastructure to handle the increase in pedestrian MTA rider and driver tra <clears throat> traffic that this project will bring. They also have removed a proposal and proposed benefits for, for the community like a new school from what they are planning. Despite all of this, they would be receiving staggering tax breaks that we will foot the bill for down the line. Astoria deserves better than what Innovation Queens has put on the table. We must not settle for the bare minimum positive impact at such a monumental cost. Look at their environmental impact statement. Think of all the immigrant and working class businesses that face being displaced without compensation or even adequate communication or outreach. Think of the quite literal massive shadows that these 20 plus story buildings will cast on the homes and businesses forced to be at their feet. This is not the best or the only answer. We need a better offer or a different option altogether. We have seen better arrangements happen recently in other neighborhoods like Harlem. We have a chance to make the revitalization of Astoria community-led and community-oriented. We do not need our innovation to come from groups of billionaires who do not live here. We are a neighborhood of diverse people who care about the future of our home. And I fully believe that we can come together to find and implement solutions that lift up Astoria and the people who make it wonderful. A story is worth more than what Innovation Queens has brought to the table. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. White. Appreciate it. And, and just, just for my understanding, the, the Harlem example that you cited for precedent, um, which, which one were you, were you pointing to when you, when you were saying that? Uh, I believe it's been mentioned already. It's uh, 145, but we've also seen buildings that have been bought by the city and sold back to the people who are currently living in them. There are other things like that throughout the city that have provided more a higher percentage of affordable units in buildings such as that it's been similar 145, 145 was the example okay yes. got it thank you um okay mr um let's see ernie brooks ernie is not in the room uh carolina korth promoting Carolina right now. Ms. Ms. Korth, you should be able to unmute your microphone. I, I did. Did you hear me you now? I did. Now we can hear you. Great. So I apologize that I'll be talking to you as I walk to the MR station at Steinway. I am about to fly out, but I really wanted to speak. Um, I, my name is Carolina Korth, obviously. I've lived in the story for 16 years. I'm right down the street from where this uh, development is going to be, and I have been uh, acted with a story not for sale in fact wrote the petition that we first put out two years ago which now has 3,105 signers and I believe that it went to your email earlier Mr. 
uh, Garodnik took a guess at your email address that's from another one that I had. Um, so many people have said so many wonderful things about the myriad concerns that we have. Uh, I personally will say that the developers make it sound like they've done all of this outreach. And I personally, just earlier this summer, went to so many businesses, actually, I think almost every single business uh, between Steinway and 43rd to ask them, has anyone from the development team come to talk to you? Not a single one said yes, no, one said yes. Everyone else is completely in the dark. So a lot of the outreach that these developers have done have just been because we've been shaming them. I really just want to jump on this because so many people have said so many important things that I don't need to reiterate to say we need a new paradigm. So many of the commissioners, I thank you for some of the comments, uh, questions and concerns that you've presented because you are spot on. We cannot continue to have developers say, yeah, no, I can't do more than the legally required uh, mandated affordable housing unless I get subsidies. These are billionaire developers, cry me a river. They have created the problem that we are in. Market rent is really as high as the market will bear rent. And we need to recognize that and do better for our city. And I really encourage you to help us set this new paradigm. I know that legislation needs to change on a city level, on a state level. I am so excited to see council member Julie Wan start to put these conversations out there. But I encourage you as a commission that you are seeing us in this affordability crisis, in this vacancy crisis, when we all know there are a ton of apartments that are actually empty or on Airbnb. Uh, I encourage you to continue asking these questions and really push for this new paradigm. I will be submitting the petition further to your comments, uh, to the comment page. Um, and I, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them before I jump on the train. Great. Well, we thank you for uh, for joining us, and uh, we'll make sure that um, the commission has the uh, petition in its official packet. So, thank you for that. Um, let us. Um, yeah, looks like we can. We don't need to keep you from your train. So, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. Which, if I could throw on there, I've been going uh, to the Steinway stop on the MR for uh, all, at least thirteen years now. It's, I, I agree with Nancy Silverman. It was so packed morning and evening prior to COVID. So the fact that that did not come up in any of the studies is like kind of ridiculous. It's almost laughable. It makes me really question the rest of um, the assessments made on impacts to infrastructure, which everyone else has brought up very, very adequately. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Um, you too. Take care. Uh, okay, um, Maria Fattore and Carl Alston, I understand, are not in the room. Uh, so I will move on to Joe DiStefano. Here we go. Uh, hello there. Hello. Can, you, hello. can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, great. Uh, thanks to everyone who spoke before me. Thanks to the uh, City Planning Commission for the opportunity to speak uh, in support of Innovation Queens. Uh, my name is Joe DiStefano, and I've been uh, involved in various things in food in Queens for more than 20 years. And the development team approached me when uh, the project was just coming to be. And they said, you know, hey, do you want to work on a, uh, a food hall for this project? Do you want to help bring the, uh, the foods and businesses that you're passionate about to this underused part of Astoria. And, uh, you know, I, I say this just in full transparency because it's the truth. Uh, Tracy Capune approached me and I said, yes, I would like to do that. And um, I think it's a great opportunity for 
existing businesses in Queens to uh, get revitalized and to bring other small businesses, uh, I'll be honest, some of which are in my network uh, into the, uh, the project. You know, I really, um, I like to joke, you know, I don't speak in support of a story. I speak in support of all of Queens. And I think that Innovation Queens is uh, good for Astoria itself and good, you know, good for Queens itself and all of Astoria. So uh, I think a lot of people have uh, said a lot of uh, things, good and bad about it. And uh, I would hope that you all take those into consideration. And uh, I, rem I remain excited about the possibility of it coming to fruition. Thank you for your time, I yield my time. Great, thank you very much. Um, and we appreciate your uh, your testimony and your comment. Let me uh, move on to Nick Pepe. Do we do we have him in the room? Um, there is a uh, an Alex Malesio who ah. is in the room. Okay, let's go with Alex Malesio because actually he's ahead of Nick Pepe and I just missed him. So, Mr. Malesio, my apologies. You are next, and we'll look for Mr. Pepe next. And uh, whenever you are ready, you can go ahead and proceed. No worries. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Gorodnik and the commissioners for uh, hearing my testimony today. My name is Alex Malesio and I'm the Senior Director of Programs at Urban Upbound. Today I'm reading testimony on behalf of Urban Upbound's Chief Operating Officer, Carlos Cano, who is unable to attend today's hearing. City, Pl City Planning Commissioners, Urban Upbound is speaking today in support of Innovation Queens. Urban Upbound is dedicated to breaking cycles of poverty in New York City public housing and other low-income neighborhoods. We provide underserved youth and adults with the tools and resources needed to achieve economic prosperity and self-sufficiency through six comprehensive integrated programs, employment services, college access and youth development, financial fitness and affordable housing, tax prep and income support services, worker cooperative development and business innovation, and financial inclusion services anchored by the Urban Upbound Federal Credit Union. Innovation Queens presents Astoria and Long Island City with an opportunity for affordable and senior housing, low market rate space for nonprofit organizations, and thousands of jobs, including a commitment to prioritize the contracting of minority women and locally owned business enterprises. We at Urban Upbound look forward to using these opportunities before us to augment our programming and reach additional New Yorkers in need. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I understand that we do not uh, have Mr. Uh, Pepe, uh, John Malatiadis, um, also here or not here, Ryan? Uh, not in the room, no. Not here, uh, Donal Cogdell. That's right. That's nice. Donald Cogdell. Okay, great. Hope Justice. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, this time, uh, Commission. Um, yeah. So I, I definitely, I, I am. Uh, I used to live in Astoria, uh, but now I am just uh, a minister in Astoria. We, me and my wife, moved because the rent prices were a little bit too high for us. And, you know, this is the bulk of my concern for the community of a story, which our congregants are definitely in, and we're right in uh, on 35th Street. Um, so right there in the mix of things. And, you know, when you look at what Innovation Queen says, they say that, you know, this is a community driven plan to build upon a story's rich and cultural uh, 
fabric. And um, I just, I have problems with that. If it's a community driven plan, um, it, it should correlate with more of the demand of the community. And from what I'm getting, the, the demand for this project is not high with the community. Um, and the affordable housing percentage would be a lot higher if this was really for the community. You know, in our work, as we survey how to be good neighbors and how to love our community, you know, one of the biggest problems and issues was, you know, rent, rent burden, you know, and with 75% uh, luxury housing, um, a part of this project, you know, people will be displaced, uh, will have to move, and it's just not very uh, welcoming for the community. There's so many other concerns, as was mentioned earlier before, between, you know, congestion um, and, and just all the back and forth. I just don't feel like the community is of high priority around this project. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely think that you guys should, you know, vote no and, you know, think about your neighbor, you know, think about the community. Uh, because the demand is not coming from within the community, the demand is coming from out outside of the community, and and so uh, this scale is just, I mean, it, it's we haven't seen nothing like it in a long, long time in Astoria, and I, I just it's, it's super ambitious, and and when you have ambitious scales, the people get lost in the cracks, and um, so I, I just ask that you take that into consideration. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, we, and we, we will, we appreciate it. Uh, let me um, move on to John Restrepo. Uh, Mr. Restrepo, you should be able to unmute yourself and testify. There we go. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, this is actually John Melitiatis. I know you called another John, but um, it was me before. I think you skipped me over. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, to the members of the City Planning Commission. Uh, I'm John Melitiatis. I'm not representing a group. I'm an individual in favor of the project. I've been excited ever since um, I heard of it. I understand that there's a fear of the project. I understand that it's a stressful. I understand why it's stressful for many people. Uh, doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Um, uh, it can be done with certain conditions, of course, that, that people in the city are, are attending to and asking the right questions. I'll provide you some background. I'm, I'm, I'm a <clears throat> son of Greek immigrants. They immigrated to Astoria many years ago in the late 60s. I grew up in 35th Avenue, I've been to PS 166 right down the block. Um, my father's an illiterate uh, New York City, a retired yellow taxi driver. Uh, certainly not a silver spoon uh, uh, with me here. And my mom was a school aide in Astoria. I, I work for a nonprofit. My wife is a teacher in Astoria. So we're in another community. We saved for 25 years to buy our first home and we finally did it. It can be done, but you have to cut out all expenses and do it, right? Um, so if you work really hard, I do believe you can get there over many, many years with a lot of sacrifice. I saw Kaufman transform Astoria. It was you know, broken glass, boarded up windows, and Kaufman did wonders for my neighborhood, which was at the time a very dangerous uh, neighborhood, but we invested early. My father invested early in the 80s, barely being able to afford it, and finally paid off his house last month, okay, and he's 86. So it's a long, long uh, way, but I don't see any reason he can't be rewarded for that investment and why the neighborhood can't improve. Um, I do understand the public transport, the N and the W, to be fair, is overrun. I agree with that. The R has some slack, especially on Northern Boulevard and 36th. Uh, there, there is some capacity there. You know, I'm trying to present both sides of the situation rather than be one-sided like a lot of people are, are doing in terms of just presenting a case. It's not, you know, a legal case. I think it's important that we're fair as individuals. So I do understand the two sides of, of things. I saw a lot of people from community housing and public housing, Ravenswood, Queensbridge, others present. And interestingly enough, I heard testimony that a lot of them do want this project. And the reason they want it is not because they could afford an apartment there. It's because they could actually enjoy the amenities and some of the green space that's being promised. So uh, that should also be a, definitely a consideration. 
um, for the project because, it, because I think it's well organized. I think it'll beautify the area. I think it'll provide uh, jobs. Um, I, I do don't want anybody displaced, obviously. And we heard from Jay Martin that there were six families that they're working with, and I hope they do find um, housing for them. Right now, there's mechanic shops, there's PC Richards, a large lot in front of PC Richards that is completely underutilized. I mean, not everybody there is going to PC Richards or shop. It's an enormous lot if you go look at it. Um, and so I do think that, you know, given the economic climate, the recession that people are saying is coming for jobs, for customers for Steinway Street, which need it, and just an infusion of capital in the tax base for the city that can be used for other great purposes. I'm all for the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, we're going to move now to uh, Julia Foreman. We have Ms. Foreman in the room. There, yes, there she is. Yes, hi. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you uh, letting me come on at this late hour to talk about this project. Um, I recently moved. For, I had lived in the area where this project is supposed to uh, start for about seven years. Um, I lived about three blocks away from where where the parameters are, and I recently had to move. Um, just simply because I couldn't afford to stay in the area. And I know that many people have spoken in a lot greater detail than me earlier today um, about the affordability. Uh, but what I really wanna speak about, uh, which I, I think other people also brought up is how this is going to change simply the character of the neighborhood. Um, and the affordability of the units is one thing, but the fact of the matter is around neighborhoods where projects of this scale occur, you see the affordability of those units also be affected. You see that everything around it becomes more expensive and you see a push of people out. There's no reason why a landlord would see this building with $5,000 rents and continue to charge what I was paying. I was only paying, I think, sixteen thirty dollars by the time I moved out of my apartment last year. Um, there's no reason that my landlord or any other landlord in the area would continue to charge those rents when they're, you know, a, a $2,500 rent is now competitive to a $5,000 rent. Um, and this is something that you're gonna see across the board. You're also going to see the really, you know, small micro businesses. I appreciate that right now Steinway Street is underutilized and I don't disagree that there should be a plan to address that, but there are businesses there. There are small businesses, there are delis, there's um, a meat store, all these small businesses, we're gonna to continue to see a push out. And the one thing that really affected me and that was really a concern for me when I still lived in the area and this was first announced is the shadows that this is going to cast over existing residents. And I, I don't mean that in a metaphorical way. I mean, there's going to be a physical shadow over people's homes. And, and I think we all know, I think coming out of, you know, a, a two and a half year period where people often were staying inside, the idea of being in a shadow when you once had sunshine, when you were in your home, I, I just can't imagine any reason why that should be approved, why that should be inflicted upon a, a really thriving community, an immigrant community, a very diverse community. Um, other people have spoken about affordability. Other people have spoken about how this really is not going to benefit the neighborhood. You've heard from neighbors about that. And I really urge you to follow the lead of the community board and our borough president and vote no on this project. Thank you all for your time and hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. And to you too. Uh, let's go on to Gilbert Pickett. To be followed by Ali Bader. Uh, Gilbert Pickett is not in the room, neither about, is Ali Bader. Okay, how about Anna Contreras? Hi, can you, can you hear me? Is that you, Ms. Contreras? Yes, this is- Welcome, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Go thank ahead. You, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank you for giving the neighbors um, a platform to speak their minds. Uh, I, I have lived in Astoria for, for many years and I have moved uh, within the area. Uh, my opinion is that our neighborhood has a big opportunity to improve, advance and recover from what has been a rough couple of years for New York City, uh, especially after the pandemic, after COVID. Um, I believe that this is a great opportunity for the creation of jobs for local people, um, the space for more local businesses, space for the incoming neighbors that are already planning on moving here. Uh, innovations are already happening across the city. Uh, we have seen some in Queens and they're still going to happen. So I think that it's a good opportunity to have this uh, specific innovation bring nonprofit organizations, jobs, space for local spending, um, housing that is already much needed. And I think that the amount of affordable units are still a pretty huge amount of units, uh, considering that Astoria, um, we live in buildings average of five floors. And I do think that it's, it's still a pretty big amount of, of units. Uh, so thank you. I, I do support the innovation and I think that it will be a good um, opportunity for Astoria. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Contreras. We appreciate it. Um, let us go on to Corwin Mason. Yes. Good afternoon, City Planning Commission. My name is Pas can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, cool. My name is Pastor Corwin S. Mason. I'm the senior pastor of the Community Church of Astoria. As an advocate for my community, I'm always looking for projects that will bring truly affordable options to our residents. New affordable housing in Western Queens is not a desire, but rather a need. Many NYCHA residents are living in substandard conditions where they are constantly overlooked and grossly undeserved. Affordable housing is incredibly limited, leaving many residents with no way, to, no way out of the NYCHA cycle. I'm writing today to express my support for Innovation Queens. While 800 plus new affordable units will not benefit every resident in need, it is a glimpse of hope for thousands of Astoria residents seeking new affordable housing. I'm also excited about the innovation in business, workforce development, that will be very important part of this project, community wealth building, is vitally important in undeserved communities. I strongly believe that this project is a step in the right direction, working with reliable nonprofit partners. In addition to the affordable housing component, these community partnerships truly make this project worthwhile. Please accept this testimony as my support for the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. We accept it. Thanks for that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, we appreciate it. Uh, let me go to Commissioner Osorio. Thank you so much for your testimony. I was wondering if you can expand a little bit on the innovation workforce development opportunities that you referenced. Um, just um, preparing individuals in the communities for work, um, getting them work ready um, with the skills needed to do whatever job they're applying for as far as this project is concerned. Can, but can you specify a little bit, like what in, in particular is the project proposing in this regard? Well, with the construction, the security, um, security training, uh, things of that nature. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mason. We appreciate it. Uh, let us uh, move on to Hassan Clark. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good. My name is Reverend Hassan J. Clark, and I'm the senior associate pastor of the Center of Hope International based in Long Island City, New York. I am in full support of the rezoning of Innovation Queens in this project. The development will help support local small businesses, as well as creating over 5,000 affordable uh, jobs and uh, opportunities for low-income individuals. My church is based in Long Island City, Astoria. I am a resident. Uh, I was born and raised in Astoria houses. So not the Dipmars, not the Steinway, NYCHA, Astoria housing. 
to a single mother of five children, and I was able to make it out of that type of situation. So when I think about uh, the Innovation Queens in this project, I'm thinking about some of the things that transpired in the local neighborhoods just last week that did not make the news. Like the three shootings, a shooting in Long Island City, Queensbridge, where a young man was shot in his face, another two shootings that took place in Astoria, four in the afternoon, as well as 7.15 in the morning, just last week, that did not make the news. So when I think about Innovation Queens, I'm thinking about my members, I'm thinking about those individuals who live in public housing, NYCHA. They live in these communities and they want the opportunity to have better living and better jobs. The jobs is really key. So all we're asking is for the opportunity. Give them an opportunity to come with this project so that these jobs and this affordable housing could come into a community that I'm from. And yes, I don't speak for myself because now I'm a homeowner because I had some good mentors and people to help me along the way. But I speak for hundreds of others and even thousands who don't have that opportunity. Please accept my strong consideration for this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Certainly accepted. Thank you for being with us. Uh, let's go to Tony Barsamian. Tony is not in the room. How about, uh, is Gilbert Pickett back? Yes, Gilbert is in the room. Okay. Mr. Pickett, if you're there. I Thank you so much. You we're not there when I called you, so glad you're here. Welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm doing mission work. I'm in the hospital. <laughs> but thank you for the opportunity. Listen, Thanks we, for we, calling me totally back. Get it. I thank really you. appreciate it. Sure. Uh, I am calling in support of uh, Innovation Queens uh, as a pastor, born and raised in Queens, pastor in the Corona community, have plenty of members, Ravenswood, Queensbridge, Astoria, Woodside, uh, who are not only looking for affordable housing, and I thank God that this project supplies affordable housing, jobs, and training and opportunities. But as I've been sharing with the borough president, uh, we in Community Board 3 also have been experiencing uh, housing discrimination. And it's just unfortunate that people of uh, color have been selling their houses to immigrants and those moving into our communities means when it comes to renting from them, they can't. So affordable housing like this is very needed and necessary. Uh, we all know that rent is so high here in New York. Everybody wants to come to New York. It's a melting pot of the world and I understand. And so therefore uh, we should make room for those who uh, are not able to pay the high rents of Manhattan uh, and alike. Uh, so therefore, you know, being that uh, this project would do so much for so many in terms of black and brown people who are working very hard. We are, and I'm a part of it, we are a part of the working poor. We're looking for somewhere decent to stay who have a quality of life about them. And so therefore this project should go for uh, based upon the fact that people who are working hard for the city of New York, in the city of New York, need places to stay, to work and to play and to have a good time. And Queens is definitely the best borough in all of New York City. Thank you so much. And I hope this project goes through. Thank you very much. We love Queens too. So we appreciate it. Thank you for that. Thanks for coming back. Okay. Bye. Let's go to, uh, I understand John Zara is not in the room, so let's go to Steve Moscovich. Hello, can you hear me? We, we can hear you. It's a little okay, quiet, right. but we can hear you. Okay. There we go. Okay, we okay. all right. All right, thanks for uh, allowing me time to speak. Um, I just wanna say that I've been, uh, I've been in the neighborhood for 20 years now. And um, I think Astoria is one of the best neighborhoods 
um, in the city and certainly in Queens. And I think that, I mean, this project's gonna, is gonna be very helpful um, to businesses and, <clears throat> and also to other residents um, in the neighborhood. Uh, I just wanna say that the developers have been in touch with me. They've been very forthright, been very honest. Um, and I urge all the commissioners, if you're not familiar with the area where the project's gonna take place, to take a walk, follow the map and walk on the streets. And you'll see that this project is a huge improvement over what's currently there. And then it's all gonna make sense to you. And I think that I feel bad for all the people with the problems about their rent and their gas being turned on and off, but <clears throat> that's not the fault of this project. That's, you know, it's, it, it, rent is gonna go up anyway. And I hope that this project actually with the, with the 700 or so units of affordable housing is gonna help solve that problem. So uh, I yield the rest of my time and uh, I'm open to any questions. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate your, uh, okay. your comment Thank and, you. your, and your testimony. I don't see uh, questions, so we'll, uh, we'll let you go, but we appreciate your being here. Okay, Thank thanks you. so much. Um, I understand Kate Cunningham is not with us, so let's go to uh, Carlo Casa. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate it. So my name is Carlo Casa. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the New York Building Congress. Um, I'm testifying on behalf of Carlo A. Shisura, President and CEO of the New York Building Congress. The Building Congress is a membership organization uh, committed to promoting the growth and success of the building industry in New York City. We represent over 550 constituent organizations comprising more than 250,000 skilled tradespeople and professionals. At the height of the pandemic, unemployment, predominantly affecting low-income communities of color, reached 30% in Astoria. The Innovation Queens project will create over 5,000 much needed jobs for the community, including 3,700 jobs during construction and 1,700 permanent jobs, most of which will be well paying union jobs. That is 10 times the number of jobs currently available in the immediate area. Additionally, this development would spark over 50 million in new spending to existing small businesses nearby. This development will also bring in a wide variety of community services and amenities that Astoria needs, including a major community innovation hub where nonprofit organizations such as Hannock, the Floating Hospital, the LGBTQ network, and many other more, more can expand their services in Astoria. Lastly, but crucially, our city is facing a housing crisis, and this project will include over 700 units of permanently affordable housing. I urge you to support the Innovation Queens project. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, great. Thank you for being here. Let me let me uh, let me move on uh, to our last few uh, members of the public wishing to testify here. I will do um, a quick call, a final call. Uh, for anybody who wants to be heard on this matter today. Um, this is your getting to be your last chance, how you might participate. It's up here on the screen. Have a look, join us. Uh, we've got a few more people uh, who are signed up, uh, but if nobody's signed up uh, when we're done, we'll be done. So here's your last chance. Um, more than welcome to add you even at this stage. Uh, let's go to Victoria Kramer. Hi, everyone. Thank you for Hello. letting me speak today. Sure. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Corinne Haynes, the resident association president at Queensbridge Houses. Um, I believe she was on earlier, but didn't make it to the end here. Um, so on behalf of Corinne Haynes, I hope this letter finds you in good health. My name is Corinne Haynes and I am a 50 year resident of Queensbridge Houses and the proud president of the Queensbridge Resident Association. Like many residents in public housing, the sound of new housing is music to my ears. Why? Because trying to find housing while making a modest wage is an everyday conversation for many of us living in public housing. When affordable housing is being discussed 
at these hearings, it is important that we hear the voices of residents who are currently seeking and struggling to find affordable housing. I'd like to remind you all that the term affordable is very relative. Like many have said, Astoria is not affordable at the moment. There are very limited options for residents in public housing looking to leave the NYCHA cycle. There are thousands of NYCHA residents who have lived here for generations because they love their community and cannot afford to leave NYCHA. Regardless of if this project is approved or not, many of us cannot afford current rents in Astoria or Long Island City. So yes, I support this project because adding 700 plus permanently affordable apartments will make a difference in the lives of 700 families who call Astoria home. Um, thank you, and please accept this testimony as my support for rezoning. Thank you. You got, you got it. We accept it. Thanks very much. Um, let's say if Eddie George or Jorge is there. Yes, he's here. We're be able to unmute your microphone. Here we go. All right. Here we go. It's unmuted. Should be able to speak now. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Chartrand. Oh. I don't know if I'm up next. Um, I'm with Eddie, Eddie George's group. Uh, okay. okay, so you're signed in as Eddie George. So uh, we'll, why don't you, you'll testify on behalf of him and yourself, I take it. Yes, I'll testify on behalf of him and himself in the Ironworks in New York City. Uh, my name is Matt Chartrand. I'm the business manager of Local 361, representing over 3,000 iron workers in the community area. We're talking about today. Um, this project is approximately one block away from our apprenticeship school in Astoria there. And I think this opportunity between the new community coming in and the trades would be great for the people in the community, bringing them into a new lifestyle, new work experience, affording a career to them going forward. Um, I applaud the developer, what he's trying to do with the housing. We all know it's about in excess of 350000 needed housing units in New York City. This would put a little bit of a dent in it. It's a long way to go, but it's a start anyways. Um, the affordable aspect of it, 700 affordable housing, that's a great accomplishment. It could be better, which I know many people would like to see it, but it's a start and we could always work on that with the developer at this point. Um, I agree with the open space. Open space gets the community together. When everybody in the community gets together in open space they can talk about things talk about the future of the past and whatnot it's a great thing to have open space so people can get together in the community with these factors i uh put them forward to you and now uh, we support the project thank you very much thank you thanks very much for uh, being here um okay let me go to shanta alston and we'll be doing another final call here for anybody who wants to come in this is getting to be your last chance. Shanta Alston, you're up next. I don't believe we have uh, uh, Shanta. Oh, no, there she is. Shanta's in the room. Oh. Yeah. No. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, yes. Good afternoon. Yes. My name is Shantae Austin. I live in Astoria Houses, known as the Mansions, and I am opposed of this project. Uh, Astoria should not be for sale. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's move on to uh, Davin Lomax, uh, then Rena Aldrich and Elizabeta Salinovich. Hello? Yes. Hi. 
Thanks, guys, for having me on. Um, my name is Devon Lomax. I'm the political director for District Council 9, Painters and Allied Trades. Um, and we rise in support uh, of this rezoning. Uh, we have over 300 members that live um, in that community board districts, as well as uh, 10,000 members that live in New York City. Um, and we, we support it because, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, coming out of the COVID pandemic and trying to get back on our feet as New Yorkers, you know, we as a union always talk about jobs and opportunity to give to folks. There's plenty of, of, of young adults, men and women um, that would like to join the trades and a project of this size and this uh, can provide a lot of opportunity for a lot of folks in New Yorkers, um, in New York. Uh, so we do some, we do support it. Um, our training facility is also in Long Island City, um, just a few blocks away from, um, you know, from the from the, the proposed project. Um, and again, for us, it's about jobs. It's about getting getting New Yorkers back on their feet. Um, so we we rise in full support of this project. Thank you, guys. Excellent. Thanks, Devon. Uh, Mr. Lomax, we appreciate it. And thanks uh, for being here with us today. Um, Great, let's move on to Rena Aldrich. Hello, good afternoon. I am uh, reading testimony provided by Kevin Foley who was unable to stay on to uh, the meeting here. I'm writing to voice my support for Innovation Plains Astoria. I'm an owner and the manager of Goldstein and Foley. We start our small business as a carpet and cast iron stove manufacturer and hardware store on Steinway Street over 100 years ago. During all this time, we've been active in the community to better, better the quality of life and to support local businesses. While we are delighted that our area has a great reputation as a diverse and welcoming community, there are issues that need to be addressed. Foremost is the need for affordable housing. Additional, and at this point has been brought up to us time and time again, is the lack of green and open space in the area. Those who live here must travel to a story park or Long Island City to find an attractive space to play and gather in our open air. We believe the quality of life needs to be approved in our area, and we think Innovation Queens is an important step toward addressing some of these needs. It is widely thought the area of question is in need of improvement. We point to the dilapidated former dairy building and warehouses and underutilized lots, which could be turned into attractive gathering spaces. These are stated to be locations for community organizations, open fresh air, food and craft markets, affordable housing, parking, and a potential daycare center. We sincerely believe Innovation Queens will be a positive addition to our community, and we urge you to support this important effort. Thank you. I yield my time. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, let me go to Elizabeth Solonovic. Uh, Ms. Sol Solinovich, you should be able to unmute your microphone. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, my name is Elisaveta Solinovic. I'm a member of 32BJ and long-term resident of Astoria. As you know, 32BJ has largest property service union representing 85,000 property service workers across the city. We maintain clean and provide security service in buildings like the one being discussed and in inauguration Q and C. We estimate that uh, re resuming with a law, the construction of approximately 2,800 and we lead the insertion of the least 50 new building service jobs. The commitment to good permanent jobs in this project is clear. In examining the impact of the project, we hope that the commission will concern, consider how it will affect building service workers. We believe an, an investigation of projects like this should concern, consider whatever development will sustain wage standards in the building service industry. This project clearly does that. The new park space and sustainability measures proposed in this project will also benefit 32BJ member 
as the, their families. Give me one second. You have a few more seconds. You can keep going. <laughs> the best way to make sure that development like one proposed have a positive impact to building service workers for developers to make a formal commitment to pay the uh, privilege wage and create good jobs with family sustaining wages and benefits. We are pleased to let you know that we are developers uh, with he, this project. Sylvester properties have made an early commitment and create a certain prevailing wage building service job as this site. We are in full support of this project. This reasoning change for working families and benefit for developer and uphold and promote the strong standards that are placed for good building service job in New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, with that, uh, Ryan, is there anybody uh, who has signed up, who wishes to be heard, who has not yet been heard? Just Anybody in the room? No. Okay. There are no further speakers in the room. Alex. Okay. okay. All right. Well, um, with that, I'm just going to filibuster for a few seconds just to make sure. And with that, I will close the hearing on calendar numbers 23 to 33 uh, and note that the record on this item or these items will remain open through Monday, August 22nd. Uh, and I'll ask you, Madam Secretary, if there is any additional business before the commission uh, today. Uh, no, Chair Grondick, there is no other business before the commission, but I do have some public information to share. For those of you who are unable to or did not wish to testify, you can submit written testimony online by selecting this hearing on the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal through DCP's website or by mailing your comments to City Planning Commission, Calendar Information Office, 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271. Excellent. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and uh, to all of the, the staff of the agency who helped to support uh, the hearing today, uh, thank you. Um, Commissioners, thank you for your time and energies. Uh, it was a very long, uh, long day today. And of course, to the members of the public uh, who waited around patiently to have uh, their moment, we thank you very much. We know that that is not an easy thing to do and that people are, um, have a lot on their plate and a lot going on. So we, uh, we recognize that and appreciate it a lot. And of course, uh, also to the applicant team, uh, we thank you for your time, your energies, and uh, your um, interest in um, uh, investing in New York and to, uh, uh, do something meaningful. So with that, um, this remotely held meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. The time is 2.57.